Members of the Senate and guests will please rise as we receive our distinguished president. The Senate will please come to order. Members and guests will remain standing while we are led in our devotion by our chaplain, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Chaplain. While he was addressing the Colossians, Paul urged them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. From Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Bow with me as we pray. O Holy Lord, we praise you this day as these senators and their staff members continue to serve the good people of South Carolina. As they do so, dear God, allow these senators to be confident as they work for the common good, doing so boldly and assuredly. And even more so, may each one of these leaders strive to embody those very characteristics which Paul lifted up centuries ago those key traits of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. By being fully aware of the importance of these gifts that you grant, O oh God, and by working together, each of these individuals can and will accomplish so much that is good and worthwhile for each and every South Carolinian, and to you, Lord, will be the glory. So we pray in your loving name. Amen. I pledge allegiance. allegiance. Senator from Lawrence, what purpose? The quorum has been questioned. The Clerk will count. Seventeen members are present. A quorum is not. Quite the senator from Lawrence. Call of the Senate has been requested. Clerk will ring the bell. Reading clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams, present. Mr. Alexander, present. present. Mr. Allen, absent. Mr. Bennett has leave. Mr. Campson, absent. Mr. Cash, Mr. Cash is present. Mr. Clymer is present. Mr. Corbin, absent. Mr. Cromer has leave. Mr. Davis, present. Mr. Fanning, Absent, Mr. Gambrell. Absent, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett's present, Mr. Goldfinch. Absent, Mr. Grooms. Absent, Mrs. Gustafson. Absent, Mr. Harputlian, present. Mr. Hembry, present. Mr. Hutto. Absent, Mr. Jackson. Absent, Mr. Kevin Johnson. Absent, Mr. Michael Johnson, present. Mr. Kimbrell, present. Mr. Kempson. Absent, Mr. Loftus. Mr. Loftus is present. Mr. Malloy is present. Mr. Martin, present. Mr. Massey. Absent, Mrs. Matthews. Absent, Mr. McElveen. Absent, Ms. McLeod. Absent, Mr. Peeler is present. Mr. Rankin. 
absent Mr. Rice. Mr. Rice is present. Mr. Sab is present. Mr. Scott. Absent Mrs. Sin is present. Mr. Setzler is present. Mrs. Sheely is present. Mr. Stevens is present. Mr. Talley. Mr. Talley is present. Mr. Turner is present. Mr. Verdon is present. Mr. Williams, present. Mr. Young. Mr. Young is absent. Have all senators answered the roll? Have all senators? Senator Young is present. Senator Corbin is present. Senator Allen is present. Have all members answered the roll? Poll to close the step. The clerk will tabulate 27 members are present. A quorum is present. Senator from Lexington, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent request. State, on the state, next your, state your request. On the next available day, the Senate adjourned in memory of Glenn Poole, fire chief in the Hollow Creek Fire Department. Without objection. So ordered. Are there any petitions, memorials, presentments of grand jury or such like papers? President, we, have no communications. we have no communications. Therefore, we are on introduction of new bills and resolutions. The reading clerk will read. It amends a code relating to designation of voting precincts in Ori County. Judiciary. Introduction of a bill by Senator Sheely. It amends a code relating to certified copies of birth certificates to expand the definition of legal representatives and to alter the process for obtaining birth certificates. Medical affairs. Yeah. Introduction of a bill by Senator Alexander. It's relating to homestead exemptions for taxpayers 65 and over, those who are totally and permanently disabled, or those who are legally blind to provide the homestead exemption for taxpayers who are deaf. Finance Committee. Introduction of concurrent resolution by Senator Sheely recognizing the week of May 1st through 8, 2022 as Tardive Dyskinesia Awareness Week in South Carolina. Medical Affairs. Introduction of House Bill 3464, this is a bill to enact the Seizure Safe Schools Act as a section to the code to require the establishment of seizure action plans in public schools. Education Committee. Mr. President. The desk is clear. Are there any requests for local bills? Are there any requests for local bills? Hearing none. Senator Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? To ask a parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. We're in between orders, correct? I was getting ready to announce the uncontested, uh, I mean, uh, the second reading uncontested, but yes, sir, we are. So we will go to that first before we go to, we'll, we'll up to debate. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. Yes, sir. Members of the Senate, if you will turn with me to page 14 to the bottom of the page 14 h 3466 by representative long and others the reading clerk will read as a committee amendment on the desk 
Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee proposes the following amendment. It amends the bill by striking all after the enacting words and inserting Section 1, Article 1, Chapter 1 of Title 6 is amended by adding. Senator from Darno, what purpose do you rise? That, that was originally contested, and, um, and so I would respectfully move that we carry, carry that bill over. Motion is to carry over H3466. Those in favor say aye. No, I, no's, ayes have it. So ordered. Carry over 3466. That takes us to the middle of page 15, S908, by Senators from Ori and the Senator from Berkeley. The reading clerk will read. Committee amendment on the desk. We have a committee amendment on the desk. Senator from Darlington, what purpose do you rise? Move to carry that one. I have a motion to carry over S908. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. 908 is carried over. That takes us to the Senator. Bottom of the page, page 15, S947, this is by the senator from Berkeley and others. Committee amendment on the desk, Mr. President. Reading clerk has a committee amendment. We will read. Transportation committee proposes the following amendment. Mends a bill. It strikes all after the enacting S words and inserts. Senator from Pickens, what purpose do you rise? Explain the bill. To explain the amendment. I the, explain the, the amendment and the okay. bill. Okay. Recognized to explain. Okay. The bill, the purpose for the bill is the co-ops actually use an association and there's some federal regulations that are coming down that would not allow them to use the association. And this is for CDL training for their, uh, their linemen, their employees. Uh, so the, what the bill does, it says that the, the co-ops, we're talking about the electric co-ops in the state, can use their association. The amendment clarifies that it's for the employees only, that they cannot create training uh, for people outside. So I move for passage on the amendment. The pending question is the adoption of the committee amendment. Those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? No. Ayes have it. So ordered. So the pending question is second reading of S-947 as amended. Pending question. Roll call is required. The reading, the clerk will read the bill. Senator from Lincoln, Senator Sheila, what purpose do you rise? Roll, I'd like to ask for leave for um, Senator from Kershaw, Senator Gufteson, till noon. To do, without unanimous consent, without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Other names, if not, reading clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams, aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Allen, aye. Mr. Bennett has leave. Mr. Campson, aye. Mr. Cash, aye. Mr. Clymer, Mr. Clymer not voting. Mr. Corbin, aye. Mr. Cromer has leave. Mr. Davis, aye. Mr. Fanning, aye. Mr. Gambrel, aye. Mr. Garrett. Aye. Mr. Goldfinch. Not voting, Mr. Grooms. Mr. Grooms not voting. Mrs. Gustafson has leave. Mr. Harputlian. Aye. Mr. Hembry. Aye. Mr. Hutto. Mr. Hutto votes aye. Mr. Jackson. Not voting, Mr. Kevin Johnson. Aye. Mr. Michael Johnson. Aye. Mr. Kimbrell. Aye. Mr. Kempson. Not voting, Mr. Loftus. Aye. Mr. Malloy. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mrs. Matthews. Not voting, Mr. McElveen. Not voting, Ms. McLeod. Not voting, Mr. Peeler. Aye. Mr. Rankin. Mr. Rankin not voting, Mr. Rice. Aye. Mr. Sab. Aye, Mr. Scott. Not voting, Mrs. Sin. Aye, Mr. Setzler. Aye, Mrs. Sheely. Aye, Mr. Stevens. Aye, Mr. Talley. Aye, Mr. Turner. Aye, Mr. Verdon. Aye, Mr. Williams. Aye, 
Mr. Young. Mr. Young votes aye. All senators voted. Senator Clymer votes aye. Other members, other members of the Senate. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. By a vote of 33 to 0, the bill is given second reading. S-947 is given second reading. Members of the Senate, that takes us to page 16, to the basically to the top of the page, H-3211. Amendment on the desk, Mr. Have an amendment on the desk. The reading clerk will read. Senator from Aiken, what, I purpose like do you, what purpose do you rise? Explanation for the bill. Wait. Um, this bill will extend the sunset date of the Joint Citizens and Legislative Committee on Children from December 31 of 2023 to December 31 of 2030. And I think there's an, an um, um, amendment on the desk. There is an amendment. And uh, ask, um, I'll ask the clerk to publish the amendment. Amendment is by Senator Young. Men's the bill adds appropriate number to new section. If I could, I'd like to explain the amendment. You recognize to explain the amendment? Um, the amendment would add the following agent, agency heads as ex officio non voting members of this Joint Citizens and Legislative Committee on Children. Uh, first, the Department of Health and Environmental Control. Number two, the Department of Health and Human Services. Number three, the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. Number four, South Carolina First Steps for adoption of the amendment. The pending question is the adoption of the amendment. All in favor would say aye. aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. So ordered. Now move to um, Senator from Darden, what purpose do you ask? See if the Senator from Aiken will yield for a question. Senator yield for a question? Yep. Senator, Senator yields. Senator, thank you. What's the wisdom of setting a sunset now? We continue to change in the sunset why don't, is there any reason that we just don't authorize it? And if the Senate ever decides that they need to stop it, then they put a sunset on it? I mean, we could, it, that didn't come up in the subcommittee. Um, that, that, you know, it was, uh, this bill passed quickly in the subcommittee. Sure, I think it should Extend, pass. Yeah, extending it out, you know, another seven years. Um, so we can't bind another General Assembly anyway, so, so why don't we just pass the bill? and not, sun, not sunset, it's a worthwhile endeavor. And so I think that if we send a message that we think it needs to be there without the sunset, I think it's, it would be helpful. That's just my thoughts. I'm happy to, to, to pass it and do it however you want to do it, but I, and we can obviously do that on the third, on the third reading, but uh, I don't see the need in sunsetting it in a time period past the next assembly. Um, Mr. President. Senator from Aiken. A unanimous consent request. State your request. Unanimous consent to give this bill second reading um, and allow amendments on third and waive the two-thirds rule. Three-fifths rule. And would that include holding off on roll call to third reading? Yes, and the roll, hold the roll call to third reading. Okay. Is there objection to the unanimous consent to give this bill second reading, carrying over amendments and waiving the rule? Hearing none. So ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. That takes us to H3590, Senator from Spartanburg. Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? To make a point of order. State, state your point. Under Rule 39, this bill has not been on the calendar the required amount of time. I will sustain your point of order. Thank you. That takes us to the top of page 17, H4815, by Representative Smith. The reading President, clerk will read. Never Senator, mind. S Senator from Spartanburg. Senator from Cherokee. Yes, sir. I was to explain the resolution. You're recognized. Now, this joint resolution, H4815, has the same effect for this year as H3481 did last year. Normally, at the end of the State health plan year, that's December 31st. Funds left over after all bills are paid are deposited to other post-employee benefits account. This joint resolution directs the Public Employee Benefits Authority to keep the access of the state health plan to help with their cash flow. Pending question is second reading of H4815. 
15. Roll call is required. Clerk will ring the bell. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams not voting. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Aye. Mr. Allen. Aye. Mr. Bennett has leave. Mr. Campson. Not voting. Mr. Cash. Not voting. Mr. Clymer. Not voting. Mr. Corbin. Aye. Mr. Cromer has leave. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mr. Fanning. Aye. Mr. Gabriel. Aye. Mr. Garrett. Aye. Mr. Goldfinch. Not voting, Mr. Grooms. Not voting, Mrs. Gustafson has leave. Mr. Harputlian. Aye. Mr. Hembry. Aye. Mr. Hutto. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Not voting, Mr. Kevin Johnson. Aye. Mr. Michael Johnson. Aye. Mr. Kimbrell. Mr. Kimbrell not voting, Mr. Kempson. Mr. Kempson not voting, Mr. Loftus. Aye. Mr. Malloy. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mrs. Matthews. Not voting, Mr. McElveen. Not voting, Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod not voting, Mr. Peeler. Aye. Mr. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Rice. Aye. Mr. Saab. Aye. Mr. Scott. Aye. Mrs. Sin. Mrs. Sin not voting. Mr. Setzler. Aye. Mrs. Sheely. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Mr. Talley. Aye. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Verdon. Aye. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Have all senators voted? Senator Sin votes aye. Senator Clymer votes aye. Senator Campson votes aye. Senator Goldfinch votes aye. Senator Adams votes aye. Senator Kimbrell votes aye. Senator Cash votes aye. Senator uh, McElveen votes aye. Have all members voted? Have all members voted. Polls have closed. Clerk will tabulate. By a vote of 37 to 0, H4815 has been given second reading. Members of the Senate, that takes us to, to continuing on page 17. Senator Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? I rise to make a unanimous consent request before you move on to the next bill. State your request. That H4815 receive an automatic third reading tomorrow. Have a unanimous consent. Senator from Darlin, what purpose do you ask? We object to make, to make a statement. Objection is heard. Mr. President. Senator from Darlin. So I, I just want to just end up alerting the body that we are here um, in an exigent circumstance and situation that I, don't, that I don't know that the body probably fully captured because of just what was going on from, from, from the outside. It appears that this is a, a bill of exigent circumstances that where these, um, so these funds could not be diverted for use other than to pay the health, um, the health um, plan claims. And if we don't do this, then obviously it is to the detriment of some of the citizens in our area that are, that, that, that are state employees. It has to be done by the 31st um, of this year, and so we don't get a chance to, come, to end up coming back. And even though with the former president, chairman of finance, the, 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 the precedent that we were trying to set is, is to not have automatic third readings, so it gives everybody a chance to end up having a review. But I wanted to be able to say that we got a chance to take a look at this. It's, um, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult for those that are not on the finance committee. I remember last year, the senator from Dorchester explained it in the same way 
but basically, if, if we don't have this, if we have this automatic sweep, then it becomes problematic to end up paying the claims and it may end up causing the premiums to end up rising. And for those reasons, I think that it's, that it's imperative and something that the Senate should probably do, Senator from Cherokee, because normally we don't want this to happen, but in this situation with the transition and the timeliness, I think it's totally appropriate. So with that, I, I, I would uh, yield back to the Senator from Spartanburg so he can make his request. Senator from Spartanburg, you renew your unanimous consent request? Yes, sir. So unanimous consent request to give H4815 automatic third reading tomorrow. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered H30, uh, H4815 would be given third reading tomorrow. Thank you, Senator. We'll continue on page 17, brings us to the middle of the page, S1000, by the Senator from Clarendon. We have an amendment on the desk. The reading clerk will read. Amendment is by Senator Kevin Johnson, amends a resolution, page two, Se Senator line 36. Senator from Clarendon, what purpose Thank do you Thank you, Mr. Rise? President. Just to ex explain the amendment, if I may. Yes, sir. You recognize. Yes, in, 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 the, in the title of the bill, it refers to Dondros Highway. In the body, it refers to it as Dondros Causeway. Uh, we're co consulting with the family. They prefer Causeway. And this bill, just this amendment just makes it uniform that it's Causeway in both locations. Thank you, sir. Pending questions, adoption of the amendment. All in favor, say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it so ordered. So the pending question is adoption of resolution S-1000. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it S-1000 is adopted. That takes us to the bottom of page 17, S-1012 by the senator from Orangeburg. The reading clerk will read. Current resolution to request the Department of Transportation name a portion of U.S. Highway 78 in Orangeburg County in the town of Branch for the Betty Henderson Highway. Senator, Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Marks. Stevens, what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, move for adoption of uh, this resolution and third reading on to tomorrow. Pending, the pending question is the adoption of S-1012. All in favor say aye. I oppose no eyes have it, so it is it is adopted. So Senator from Spartanburg. I rise to make a unanimous consent request. Please state your request. I would like to be added to a, as sponsor or co sponsor to Senate Bill one thousand that just received reading. The road naming bill. Yes, sir. Thank without you. without objection. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Senator from Clarendon, what purpose do you have? Unanimous consent request. I, I, I respect the remarks by my friend, the Senator from Darlington. This, is, this resolution was something that uh, we tried to get done for a while before this gentleman, the Honorary, passed away. We couldn't get it done before his death, but I want to get it done as soon as possible. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent that this resolution receives automatic third reading tomorrow. Thank you. I stand corrected. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Senator from Pickens, what purpose do you rise, sir? Mr. President, we gave second reading to 947 a few minutes ago when we had a roll call. I ask unanimous consent to give third tomorrow because it is time sensitive due to federal regulations. So you're asking on the bottom of page 15, S 947, unanimous consent to give that a third reading? Tomorrow. Senator from Darlington, what purpose do you rise? Temporary object to see if the Senator will yield for a question. I will. The temporary objection, the Senator will yield for a question. So, Senator, um, so what's the exigent circumstances with the regulation? Help us understand that. What is the issue with the federal regs? Yes, sir. It's got to do with training, being able to give CDL training uh, for the co ops, and it allows the co ops, the bill itself allows the co ops to use their association for training versus the co-ops themselves. Right, and is there a deadline? I mean, is there a deadline at the end of this month? February 7th is the deadline on the regulation. So, so, 
So the deadline is February the 7th. Today is the 27th. Can you give us a weekend to take, to take a look at? This is just what we are trying. This is just what I want to try to avoid. That's fine. I mean, so, if you don't, if you want to hold it up and keep so these CDL just, drivers from being just, able to just, do on, job. just until Tuesday, just just a Tuesday, <laughs> and if you don't, and if and if we don't do it, on, then I mean, I think that what we're trying to do is to make certain that 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 the bills that the folks hadn't had a chance to end up looking, that if we get another day to look at it, because what I've learned is, is that if it's a good bill today, it's a good bill tomorrow, but what happens is 4815 is not a good bill tomorrow, because we won't be back in here, but this one is. That, that's all, all there is to it because I was called about an amendment that was, that was put on in committee when we were on another bill and we didn't get a chance to end up take, taking a look. And so the road naming bill is one thing. This is a substantive bill. And so with that, um, I, I would respectfully move that we carry, carry it over until. Well, um, ob 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 objecting to the unanimous consent. So we've already given it second reading. Right. Yes, and, sir. and in addition, the last part is. Yes, sir. Senator McDonald. Senator, this is a Senate bill. And so. We, we get a chance to end up talking that if, if it has to get to the House and pass two, then that, be, that, that becomes another issue. So, Jackson's uh, objection. We can come back to it. That completes objection was, was recognized on that, that. That completes the uncontested calendar. We're now in the motion period. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? With the permission of the senator from Spartanburg, I move to dispense with the balance of the motion period. With, with his permission, all in favor, please say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. So ordered. That takes us to special order on page 3, S-150 by the senator from Buford and others. With the senator from Buford by previous motion yesterday retaining the floor, the senator from Buford is recognized. Good morning, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, give you kind of an overview of, of maybe what's going to happen today. Um, I've, I've spoken to um, my friends um, who are both for this bill and against this bill and, um, and, and said that it's not my intention to be overbearing up here, repetitive, um, and I'm happy to, to let them be heard, um, both advocates and um, opponents indicated that they would rather speak next week um, and they would like for me to to go through the the various uh, sections of the bill in detail so that we kind of lay out exactly what the bill does we got we got in yesterday to uh, great discussions back and forth but um, but I, I think their their observation is right that um, that going through the bill section by section sort of to kind of get an overall understanding of each tree will help you see the forest. So um, that would be my intention today. Um, you know, after I went through um, the, the nuts and bolts of the bill in detail, um, there were members that indicated that they would have certain questions they'd like to ask me about um, the bill as well. And, and so that seems to me to be a, a logical way to, to proceed on this. Um, and, and so that's what I'll, be, I'll do. But uh, first, um, yesterday, um, uh, Mr. President, I asked for unanimous consent to distribute materials, and then we adjourned right after that. But I'll renew that, that request to distribute materials um, at this time. Without objection, materials to be distributed. Um, there was also some uh, homework that was given to me by some members. Um, Senator Sen asked me questions about um, participation in the medical uh, marijuana program in Arizona, and I didn't have those those statistics in front of me, I, I did retrieve them. Um, this, these are the numbers that were true as of uh, last August. So it's, it's about what, five, five months old. Um, the breakdown demographically, individuals between 18 and 30, 24.5% of, um, of the card issuance, 41 to 55 is 21.4%, 51 to 60 is 15.6%, 61 to 70 is 15.1 percent, 71 to 80 is 5.4 percent, and 81 and older is just just under 1 percent. So that, that's that's currently the demographic breakdown under Arizona's laws. Um, and I'll yield to my friend. What, excuse me. Uh, would Senate, the senator, senator yield for Charles a question? Senator Charleston, Senator Sam, what purpose do you rise? See, the senator would yield for a question. Senator yields. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you. Do you have in that particular, and I'm not sure if we're looking at the same data. I'm looking, I have the data directly from the government, uh, their 2021 data. What percentage of those uh, cardholders claimed chronic pain? I believe that's in the, in the 90s. I don't have the exact figure, but the over, to your 94 point, the overwhelming majority of individuals um, have chronic pain. Um, but but what, what's important to understand there as well is chronic pain is also something that is often associated with the other qualifying conditions. For instance, if you have Crohn's disease or if you've got wasting syndrome or if you've got, um, you know, the, the pain is sort of a common denominator in a lot of those qualifying conditions. So it's important to go down and if you ask the question, you know, as our bill does, I mean, unlike Arizona's bill, what our bill does is say, you can't just say chronic pain, you've got to then tie it to the etiology of that pain and what is the underlying condition that gives rise to it. So, so I guess I would make that point is that, because I'm aware of the fact that chronic pain is the overwhelming reason it is, it is authorized. And I wanted to make sure in this bill that, because pain can be a subjective thing. Somebody can come in it and say, is as a you subjective, said, subjective thing. thing. And it is a subjective thing, which is why in this bill, it requires a physician to say they have, they have diagnosed objectively an underlying condition, qualifying condition that is resulting in that pain. So I guess I'll just make that distinction between our law and the laws of a lot of other states. This, this law really goes above and beyond, what, and now it's 37 states. Mississippi just yesterday finalized the reconciliation process, and um, uh, so they're the 37th state that have legalized it. But, but again, and I'm happy to, to answer questions and to talk about what the experiences in other states have been, but I always want to qualify that by saying our bill is different, and, and it's different for a reason. It's different because I think this is the sort of bill that South Carolinians want. I, and, and so I just would make that point. But I, but I take your point about chronic pain. I understand. And I do wish that I had um, my assistants actually putting together a notebook for me right now so I don't have it right in front of me. But did I hear you say, what I, what I read yesterday was um, 30 and under were the vast majority of the card holders claiming chronic pain. That, that, that's not true. There's, there's 28,041 card holders between 18 and 30. Um, out of the total of 114,182 cards, so that translates into 24.5% of card holders are between the ages of 18 and 30. How many of the 18 and 30 group, which arguably is the healthiest demographic, is claiming chronic pain? I don't have that cross tab, but I would infer that since chronic pain is the overwhelming condition, I would say that probably corresponds with this as, to that group as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and members, I just passed out because there was, there was a question yesterday. I kept talking about um, the states that had, had legalized um, uh, cannabis for med medical purposes. I just had distributed um, materials to give you an idea um, of, of what those states are so that you can kind of view and understand what I'm meaning. Um, and just in your mind or even in your desk, if you have a highlighter, you can shade in Mississippi in green in that it um, approved medical cannabis yesterday. Senator from McCormick, what purpose do you rise, sir? So we could do the doctor of the day. Absolutely. With the senator from Buford retaining the floor, the senator from McCormick is recognized to introduce the doctor of the day. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to invite and have as our doctor of the day, Dr. from Greenwood. So Dr. Gregory Terracetis, uh, is an MD in Greenwood. He's a past president of the South Carolina Medical Association. He's an excellent uh, physician, well-loved, well-respected, and also one of ours that is involved in, in, in helping children and families with the ENT operation. They call you ortholaryngology. Is, is that pretty close? Anyway, <laughs> not even close. Not even close. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, sir. Thank you very much for your service. We appreciate your service. Welcome, welcome to the South Carolina Senate. Delighted to have you. Thank you, Senator McCormick. S Senator from Buford, recognize. After yesterday, I'm going to be the last person to criticize anybody who can't pronounce a <laughs> medical term. I mean, a lot of these words, I, I don't know where they come up with them. But um, yes, Senator from Anderson, Senator oh, Cash, Senator what Yields. purpose do you ask, sir? Senator, would you yield for a question? Sure. With Senator Yields. Senator Yields. Senator, of these 37 states, uh, 
if you know off the top of your head, w w which would be the top ones where the law that has been passed for medical marijuana would be the closest to the law that you have drafted? I'll get you an answer to that question next week, but what I can tell you is it's stricter than any of them. Well, I understand um, and, that. And, and, but, but, but I want to yeah. answer your question honestly. I don't know. I will look this weekend and find out what state and look through um, in terms of qualifying conditions, mode of consumption, um, you know, what sort of security processes are in place, who dispenses, and I'll try to come up with an answer saying I think one of these two or three states are closest to this. I, I promise to get that to you by Tuesday. I, I appreciate that. And did you know the reason I'm, I'm asking that question is the, the senator from Charleston's uh, inquire about Arizona. Uh, obviously, the states that would be the closest to the law you have drafted, it's going to be of interest to the senators to know what their experience has been in terms of who the card holders are, are uh, for what reasons they have the cards, and, and so on and so forth. I think that's, you can that's understand. A, that's an excellent point in, in that um, if we're going to look at empirical data in states that have legalized for, for medical, and if we want to then infer from that what we might expect, we should look at those states that have laws that most closely mirror ours. I think that's a fair point. I'll try to get that information for you and try to get the data in regard to their experience as well so that you have that to, uh, to look at. Um, did a lot of work last night, um, largely as a consequence of my discussions with um, uh, Senator Loftus, Senator from Greenville, uh, Senator Campson, uh, Senator from Charleston, um, Senator uh, Kimbrell, uh, Senator from Spartanburg, um, and, and others in regard to how can we bring the expertise, skill, and experience of our pharmacists into that dispensing process. Um, and um, I had a conversation um, with the head of uh, the pharmacology or the pharmacist, uh, pharmacy division in Louisiana that, that supervises the, the medical marijuana program there. Um, and I, staff is working on a comprehensive amendment that would interpose pharmacists and, and their skill sets at that frontline level with patients. And I hope to have that amendment. I will have that amendment ready by next week so we can discuss it in detail. But, but that's an excellent example of what I was saying yesterday and, and, and in all sincerity that um, I've worked on this bill for seven years, um, but there are gonna be things that haven't occurred to me or, or things that I haven't considered or, or ideas that members of this body have in that regard. And, and, and when my friends get a chance to take the well in regard to um, why they think this, pill, this bill isn't the best interest of South Carolina and as to why, I'll be listening to them closely so that I can make a good faith effort to address their concerns. Because I realize that for a lot of the members, this is the first time that they're really engaging on this. I mean, it's a 59-page bill. Um, you know, only 17 uh, senators serve on medical affairs. Um, it's a 46, well, 45-member body now. Everybody's got uh, as busy with, with other bills that are moving through other committees. And so I'm mindful of the fact that, that there are people that could weigh in on this to help improve it. And, and I pledge to you that I will listen to that and do my best uh, to incorporate those thoughts. Um, with, with that by way of background, I'll, I'll go through the bill um, in, in, in fair detail, and I think it'll probably take me about 20 to 30 minutes to kind of walk through the sections and give you an idea of, of what's in here. And then it's my understanding that there are some individuals who have questions about the various sections, and I'll be happy to, to answer those questions to the best of my ability. Um, the, the first part of the bill, uh, the preamble, is, is just simply um, whereas clauses, certain findings of fact um, in, in regard to, um, you know, why this Compassionate Care Act should be enacted. And it starts out by reciting that as of January 31, 36 states in the District of Columbia um, have authorized uh, cannabis for medicinal use. Of course, that should be 37 um, uh, states now with Mississippi having passed yesterday. Um, the, the second uh, finding of fact is in regard to some of the things I talked about yesterday that, that Congress has, has done um, to, to defer to the states in this regard. Um, I, I noted that in the Controlled Substances Act, uh, there was no declaration in there that Congress intended to preempt the field. In fact, 
Um, to the contrary, there was a statement um, in the CSA that expressly stated that it did not intend to preempt the field and that it would recognize state action taken in the area of controlled substances. I, I also walked through how the Department of um, uh, the Treasury uh, issued guidances to banks and credit unions that want to deposit proceeds uh, from medical cannabis establishments. I talked about how the IRS has promulgated uh, regulations in regard to how cannabis operators should prepare their taxes. I mean, what, what, what is particular about the cannabis industry that they need to be aware of in order to be in the IRS's good graces. Um, I talked about the, the guidance that the Department of Justice has issued in regard to mergers and acquisitions for the cannabis industry. Um, and it's, it's really, my, my point there was, there is just a general recognition at the federal government level in multiple instances that this is a reality now. States have done this, uh, states have acted legally to do this, uh, courts have upheld the state's right to do this, um, and the federal agencies are, uh, are, are responding in kind by issuing regs to provide guidance to those industries as they interact with the federal government. And then finally, of course, you have the annual uh, budget appropriation rider that prohibits the Department of Justice from using any of its appropriated uh, funds uh, to challenge any state that has um, a, a uh, medical cannabis law. So I, I think in, in multiple respects, the federal government has given the states a green light to determine what's in their state's best interest. Again, the debate here is what is in their best interest, but I, I don't want there to be you know, any lingering concern in regard to do we have the authority to act? Now, I admit it's a separate question, should we act? And that's what we're talking about. But, but at least as an initial threshold matter, there's not a federal uh, prohibition in, in that regard. Um, moving on from, um, um, well, the, in the preamble, uh, I simply talk about uh, the various um, uh, institutions uh, that have endorsed uh, the use of, of medical cannabis, the American Academy of HIV Medicine, the American College of Physicians, the American Nurses Association, the American Public Health Association, Leukemia and Lymphonia Society, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society, Epilepsy Foundation, Pain Foundation. I mean, I just, I, I, and I recite that because, um, you know, it, it's important to, to understand that even though you're talking about cannabis and something that is a federal Schedule I drug, 37 states now have legalized it, and these medical associations have endorsed it based upon a body of scientific evidence that has been developed over time since we've had medical cannabis laws in place in various states for at least two decades. Um, we then move on to the, um, uh, the first section of the act in, in talking about um, allowable amounts of, of cannabis. And here it's, it's a bit different than what you see in a lot of other states when they talk about the allowable amount of cannabis because other states allow leaf, they, they, they allow flour. And so they talk about, you know, Mississippi just passed a law, I think it talks about 3.5 ounces is what the Senate had, the House had 3.0 ounces uh, monthly of cannabis. I don't know where that ended up in the reconciliation process, but, but that's an example of how allowable amounts is described in most other states that allow burning of leaf. But because of the, the concession that we made to SLED, and, and I was glad to do so because I respect SLED, um, we don't have burning of leaf. And so what we have instead are, are oils. And, and I borrowed, or, or the bill borrows from um, what Ohio did, because Ohio also did this. They, they translated what an amount of uh, cannabis leaf would be into milligrams of, of oil, what they would be. And so, so it's broken down in, in that regard. It, it talks about um, cannab cannabis products for topical administration. And again, um, I'm in section 44-53-210 uh, under the definition of allowable amount of medical cannabis. Um, and then the first subparagraph is cannabis products for topical administration, including about the limit to patches for transdermal administration or lotions, creams or ointments, contain no more than 4,000 milligrams of Delta THC. Um, cannabis products for oral administration, uh, including not limited to oils, tinctures, capsules, edible forms, uh, contain no more than 1,600 milligrams of THC. 
uh, cannabis products that consist of oils for vaporization that contain a total of mo no more than 8,200 milligrams of delta THC. Um, and, and each of those allowable amounts is for a 14-day period. Um, Senator from Charleston, Senator Kimson, what purpose do you ask, sir? Senator Yield for a brief question. Sure, Senator, Senator Yield. Senator Yield. Senator, I, I think that is, I've, you know, I, I don't, did you know I've never smoked marijuana? Did you know that? I did not know that. Okay. Did you, uh, um, are you saying you haven't smoked it or you've never inhaled? I, I said smoke. Okay. <laughs> but I think when most, I, I think that's a point, did you know, worthy of underscoring what I hear you saying is that uh, there's not a leaf contemplated by this, uh, by this legislation. Does that mean there's no smoking of, of, of uh, the, uh, the marijuana yeah, leaf? There's, there's no combustible burning of leaf and inhaling, but you can take an oil and vape it. Okay, See, so there's a, there's a way of, 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 of consuming the product, the medical product, through vaping. Um, but in terms of lighting or burning leaf, you, and you can't even buy leaf at, at the dispensary level either. I mean, it's just, it's just oils, and, and each one of those oils, um, Sarah from Charleston, has to be labeled as to the ratio of THC to CBD, has to be inspected by an independent lab. I mean, we borrowed the best medical protocols that I can in those 37 states so that it's, it's, it's medicine, okay? So it's clearly medicine. So the, 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 the visual picture of you have is the bags that you see on TV. Are you saying they won't be bags? No, and, and, and that was, that was um, SLED's number one request when I sat down with them. And, and look, and, and, um, in the heat of the moment yesterday when, you know, when I'm attacked, when, I, when I'm called the head of an industrial marijuana complex, I, I kind of get angry. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think that it was appropriate for the SLED chief to have influenced policy the way that he has. That's my personal opinion. But I will say that I have the utmost respect for Mark Keel. And, and Chief Keel has engaged in this process. He has, I said to him, he's not going to be for this bill. And he said that, but I said, okay, I get that, but list for me the things that you really have concerns about. And number one in there was we don't want smoking of cannabis. We, we want to be able to see somebody who is smoking marijuana and know that they are doing so illegally as opposed to perhaps they're doing it for medical reasons. And you know what? I, it was a tough pill to swallow, but I did that because I wanted this to be a bill that had as much buy-in from all, fa all stakeholders as possible. Well, and you've already established that this is the Compassionate Care Act. This is not about, this is really not about commerce. It's not about what other states are doing. You're trying to solve the problems uh, with people's debilitating conditions. Senator, my question, my next question would be, how does that compare with other states? Is there smoking of uh, medical mar uh, marijuana for medical purposes there, in other states? In, in, the, in the vast majority of those states, um, you know, the, the, for instance, the state that passed it yesterday, Mississippi, allows burning of, of leaf. Um, there may be a few others, some outliers, that, that, that also have prescriptions on smoking. I can get you the exact number, but I can say with confidence that the, the overwhelming majority of the medical marijuana laws allow cannabis to be consumed by burning it and inhaling it. And with respect to the, in, uh, the, um, the application, is it uh, equally or less uh, effective? Uh, when I think of inhalation, uh, it seems to me to boost uh, or to have a more powerful impact on the body. Uh, now you're you speaking like you do have experience with it. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but, but I will say um, that the criticism of taking burning leaf out of the bill was you're taking away one of the most effective ways of consuming that medicine. You're, you're taking away to some degree the so-called entourage effect, where, where you have all sorts of cannabinoids, because there's only there's two primary cannabinoids in, in cannabis, but there are over a hundred different cannabinoids, and burning leaf gives you what's called that entourage effect with all those cannabinoids, and there's been some criticism that you're robbing patients of the ability 
to fully you know, get the, um, the efficacy of, of cannabis if you take out burning of leaf. But, but again, this whole process is about weighing pros and cons. And, and at the end of the day, uh, politics is the art of the possible. And, and, and I made the, we made the determination, uh, rightly or wrongly, that that was something we, a concession we had to make to SLED in order for this bill to have the credibility it needed to pass. I want something to pass. I, I, want, I want to empower doctors. I want people like Margaret Richardson to be able to get their medicine legally. And so that was one of the concessions, one of the many concessions that was made along the way. Well, it's clear that SLED, you listen to SLED uh, in, you know, in trying to fashion something, did you know that would be uh, suitable uh, to, to law enforcement. And the bill's but, better, the bill is better because of that engagement. And, and, and I, look, when I talk about how we've been working on this for seven years, I don't say that by way of a complaint necessarily, because when you have spirited opposition and when you've got opponents challenging your assumptions and when you have them looking at language and saying, have you thought about it, this, this consequence, you end up with a better bill. And, and so, um, I, I think that that's been in the interest of South Carolina to have had such a spirited debate over seven years with so many stakeholders, not just saying no, but, but engaging and saying, the South Carolina Medical Association gave me a list of things saying, you know what, these are some of the things we think you should consider. Same thing with Laura Hudson with the Victims Assistance Program. Same thing with Mark Heal with SLED. Same thing with, with, with um, social conservative groups. So, Senator, did you know I saw I was on that subcommittee, and I saw you uh, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of the stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, did you did you know that? Yeah, and, and we all and, did. And, and as the senator from Carlton pointed out yesterday, um, you, you you were assigned a section and engaged, and came back with comments saying this is what the stakeholders are saying. Uh, senator Bright Matthews did the same thing with law enforcement. I mean, so we had a very robust. I guess the point I would make is there was a very robust subcommittee process. Uh, not only in regard to the members themselves being engaged, but engaging the stakeholders and listening to those stakeholders. And I guess my final question would be, um, when, when, we, when we take out smoking, the burning of leaf, is it still effective for the intended purpose of the product, which is to provide some compassionate and therapeutic uh, benefit to the, uh, to the recipient? It is. Okay. It is. Thank you, Senator. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Stevens, what purpose do you rise, sir? President, the Senator, the year for sure. just a question uh, on burning. We, we Senator, Senator yields for a question. And Senator, you know that um, I, too, as my colleague from Charleston, I have not, I did not smoke marijuana while I was in college. Uh, but, but, Senator, uh, the, the contact high uh, that has uh, contributed to uh, the burning of marijuana. And you spoke about uh, vaping cannabis. Is there any effect from, from, the, from the vapor of, of, of cannabis you know of? Not that I know of, but let me get you a more precise answer on that. What, what I will say is that the, the bill does not allow even the vaping of it to be done in public. So, so I, I don't think it has the secondhand smoke. In fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't, that burning leaf would have. But in any event, the bill is, is, is structured in such a way that you cannot do it in public where you'd be around other, other people. So it's not like smoking in a, in, a, in a subway or a bus or something like that. I mean, you, you couldn't do that. And one, one last question, Senator. And do you know the, the many different uh, Brands of cannabis and to what degree that it is effective for arthritis, for um, osteoarthritis. Uh, I, I saw must be, look like about 10 different uh, screens, or 10 different things that it can actually help and is therapeutic for. It's not a, would a, I guess a physician would know uh, what variety uh, that he or she will prescribe for uh, one of uh, his or her patients. As I look at some of those, some of those names like Orange, 
mesic or whatever, whatever. And you know, it's it's ratio of of uh, THC and and others. Do we really know? Are we feel secure that what is prescribed for a particular patient is actually what he or she needs? That's, that's a great question, and, and I think it's one of the reasons why there's been this um, concern about involving pharmacists in the, in the dispensing process, because you know each, each one of these cannabis products um, in this statute have to be labeled in terms of what percent THC, what percent CBD. And, and I think that there's enough evidence out there to where how most people generally respond, you can say, okay, these ratios may be good for those with MS, these ratios may be good with people with Crohn's disease, these ratios may be best for people with epilepsy, these strains. So, so there are some general points of departure there. But again, I would say what I said yesterday is, Every individual's endocannabinoidal system that what we're made up of is different. And, and, so, and so what might be effective for one person in terms of the ratios might not be effective for another. And so I think that, that, that highlights what the senator from Charleston, Senator Kansen, was saying yesterday is we need to focus on trying to get the skill set of, of, of pharmacists down at that level um, and, and so that the pharmacist can then consult with that patient and talk about those ratios and talk about those ranges, get the feedback from the patient on whether or not it's, it's addressing the underlying condition. Because it's, it's and, and, and really I guess all medications are somewhat like that. Nobody responds to a certain medication precisely as another person does. But I think that that's particularly important in regard to, to cannabis because everybody's endocannabinoidal system is different. And do you know, Senator, after your presentation on yesterday, and specifically the one that denotes the, the general populace and their uh, feelings about uh, medical marijuana, when I got back to my office, there was something like nine uh, emails uh, that popped up where folks were thanking you and thanking others for speaking in favor of, uh, of cannabis. And one, one lady, I, I remember in particular, she talked about the many seizures that her child had over the years. And she, she went all for as Florida to try to get that child help. And when he, the child was given the opportunity to, um, to be given uh, medical marijuana, it was a total change in, in the health of that individual. So there, there are individuals out there, sir, who are actually feeling good, feeling better now about the care for their uh, family members, that there is something in the horizon that will make their lives a little brighter. And Senator, what I would say too is, is, is as this bill has moved over the last several years, um, there are a lot of anecdotal uh, experiences and, 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 and real-world testimonials like that from patients, and they're extraordinarily moving. And we heard a lot of those testimonials given at our subcommittee hearings. But, but did you know, well, I'm going to say it, so you will know it, uh -huh. um, that, that in addition to those anecdotal stories, which are legion, we now have peer-reviewed medical studies, okay, that have reached conclusions documenting how cannabis can be effective in redressing certain medical conditions. And, and, and the 13 conditions, that, that it's a very narrow set that's in this bill. Um, what I have and what I alluded to yesterday was the various uh, peer-reviewed empirical studies that establish its efficacy. So it's not just anecdotal, because that's a lot of times early on in, in debating this bill, what I'd hear back from opponents would be, oh, that's just anecdotal evidence. Those are stories. Well, first of all, you can't be dismissive of somebody's personal experience. You should never be dismissive of somebody's individual experience. But second to that, though, we do now have a, a body of peer-reviewed medical science that does show and explain why medical cannabis can be effective in addressing this condition. So it's not just the emails you get and the stories. It's also the, the, the studies that are published in journals like 
you know, uh, Journal of American Medicine and, and, and no National Institute of Health. And I mean, so this isn't some outlier thing. This is real. And, and the fact that it's real is underscored by the fact that you've got 37 states that have, that have authorized doctors to do this now. If that weren't the case, if, if it weren't the case that it actually provided relief, you wouldn't be seeing that. And Senator, do you know, and I'm referring back to a uh, comment made on yesterday concerning uh, the blood content level of alcohol uh, during an arrest and the, uh, the amount of marijuana consumed and its tendency to remain in the blood screen over a period of days or maybe even weeks. So are we truly, or do we truly know, Senator, that the contributing factor to an accident uh, was not solely because of uh, the, the marijuana that was still showing up in the blood screen? Oh, it was all alcohol. Yeah, I, I, I frankly uh, ad admit that at this point in time, we don't have a way to measure meaningfully um, THC content in a body and then to infer from that that's what caused this, this accident. Now, we, it's not like the blood alcohol content, uh, the BAC for, for, for drunk driving for, with alcohol. Um, so you are going to... Uh, law enforcement is going to have to, in incidences where somebody is driving under the influence of, of cannabis, the, the field tests um, that are conducted, um, and, and conducted now in, in, in many instances, that's going to be the predictive thing in regard to whether there's probable cause to, to, to arrest somebody. Um, but I would point out that's also the case if somebody is driving under the influence of, of, of opiates or opioids or, or, or things of that nature. I mean, um, you can't meaningfully do a blood alcohol content level test in that regard either. So, so if, if you're going to say, you, you can't put that forward as an argument for not legalizing medical cannabis unless you're prepared to outlaw a whole lot of other medicines that you can't properly assess at the time somebody's driving under the influence. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator from Buford. Thank you. Thank um, you. Senator from Charleston, Senator Sin, what purpose do you rise? To see if the senator would yield for a few questions. Yield to my friend. Senator, senator yields. Thank you. So this is just in follow-up to our colleague from the, senator from the senator from Orangeburg. You indicated that these products couldn't be done in public, um, such as on a bus or things of that nature, but, but this bill would allow the vaping of marijuana, right? It does. Okay, so... We can't tell when someone's vaping. It's happening in schools. We don't know what they're vaping. So technically, yes, you could be in a car, on a bus, whatever, and law enforcement's not going to be able to determine what's in your vape. Yeah, I'm not naive enough to think that simply because something is prescribed in this law that, that some people aren't going to break the law. I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I, mean, I think that's, that's true of, of whatever we choose to criminalize. There's always going to be people that don't follow the law. I can't dispute that, Senator. Right. And you know the laws change over the years in the states that have passed it. Um, for instance, um, I went to Heavenly Ski Resort last week. I'd been there many times before. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but did you know that this year, right by the bathrooms where you go skiing on the ski slopes and the hot chocolate for the kids and the soup bar and all of that, there is a roped off big pot leaf for people to come over and smoke on the ski slopes that, that hadn't been there before. So do you know if these laws change and get progressively easier for people to do that type of stuff in public in the states that have legalized it? I guess my response would be, and I don't know if I was answering your question yesterday about that, but um, whether or not a law progresses from, from medical to something more, depends upon the citizenry, right? Because we're all members of the Senate and we represent about 115,000 South Carolinians. You got 124 House members that represent their constituents. And if laws change, either to make it tighter or to make it more liberal, it's by and large gonna be a reflection of what those constituents want. And so I, you know, I would take exception with the fact that because they may have progressed in Colorado or California, that it's gonna progress here, the people of South Carolina are different than the people of Colorado and California. And so ultimately, I can't predict, and neither can you or nobody else, 
uh, can predict whether this law, if it's passed, would get more restrictive over time or less restrictive over time. It depends upon what the people of South Carolina want because we represent their interests. And, and you know, I'd be amazed if this General Assembly, um, simply because other states have authorized adult or recreational use, that that somehow means we're inexorably going to be do the same. I know this chamber and I know that chamber and that ain't going to happen. And, and so I think it's dangerous to generalize by comparing what has happened and in, in, in what, what are more socially liberal states with what's likely to happen in South Carolina. Thank you, Senator. May I hit upon two other points just sure. following up to the Senator from Orangeburg? Absolutely. Um, Y'all discussed seizures, and there was a person that apparently contacted his office. I bet I can guess who that person is. Um, but then we have, I'm sure you've seen that uh, Representative McCoy, who's no longer in the House of Representatives, he was a big sponsor over on the House side. Um, and he had a child that had some seizure issues. Isn't it true that the seizure issues, by and large, get resolved with CBD oil? That's, yeah. We've already passed that. Yeah, I think, it, I, think it, I think it depends on what the underlying reason for the seizures are. I think that you're right in the epilepsy context that predominantly the CBD derivative of, of cannabis is what's used to address that. Mm -hmm. But what I would also say is, in, in, in looking at you know, what the uh, Epilepsy Foundation and others have said, um, in a lot of patients, CBD may be the active component, but THC is an accelerant and helps it it helps it work its way through the body more effectively. So I would say that in many instances, even though CBD may be the predominant thing that addresses the seizures, that working together with THC, you get better results. And, and, and that's, again, that's what the medical research shows. I can get into some of that later on. But, but to your point, by and large, as a general rule, CBD is the thing that has really helped epilepsy patients in particular. Right, and the senator from Orangeburg didn't address this, but just while we're sort of on that issue, um, I know you may have mentioned it yesterday, but we already passed, I wasn't in the General Assembly at the time, a right to life uh, statute, I right, believe. Right to try. That's a right to try. So um, folks who, are, who can be, um, I guess, assumed by a doctor, the doctor's going to say is end of life within a year, uh, they already can participate in any one of hundreds of... Um, trials, medical trials, and get marijuana for free, basically. Yeah, and one, of the, and, and, and one of the points of departure for me in this bill was to kind of build on what we did in Right to Try. Because if you look at Right to Try, what a physician has to certify in order to access these non-FDA drugs is that traditional regular therapeutics or pharmaceuticals have not provided the relief, okay? And so that's why that was built into this bill in terms of what a physician has to certify. And you can't just walk in and say, I have pain, and you get a medical cannabis uh, authorization. The doctor has to go through in, a, in an in-person diagnosis and, and, and determine that regular pharmaceuticals or regular uh, FDA drugs have not worked, okay? So, so this bill is set up along the lines of that right to try as sort of a last resort. When these other things that, that you have tried haven't provided the relief, and that's when you get to the certification by the doctor that medical cannabis can be authorized. So it's very similar to right to try in that way. Okay, so, and I've heard you, and I believe you honestly believe that, um, that the doctors are really gonna have great input to make sure that these card holders are you know, seriously in pain and debilitating type illnesses. But it's true in other states that sometimes the doctor's offices are right there within the pot shops, right? Okay. It's, in fact, yeah. go ahead. There, 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 have been, there have been examples in other states where the doctor or physician authorization requirement has been a joke, where, where you just simply drive by, you check in, you get your written authorization, you're out the door. Okay? I'm, familiar, I'm familiar with that, which is why we took such great care in this bill, and, I, and I'll get to it in a moment in, in its proper section, to really outline what a physician has to do in that, in that inpatient diagnosis process. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll represent to the body without equivocation, it is, it is more thorough, more onerous, a higher degree of due diligence than any other state has. And that's what I want, because I, I, what I ultimately want is for that physician and that patient to be the ones that decide upon what's best for that patient. And I want that physician to know there's gotta be this honest conversation in regard to all of these things particularly in regard to does the patient have a history of psych, you know, psych, psychological disorders or schizophrenia, 
because as, as has been demonstrated um, in this book that I held up yesterday, it isn't good, it's not the right thing for some patients. It's not a panacea. And in some cases, it could be dangerous, and in some cases, it could be detrimental. But that's the whole reason why this bill is so heavy on that physician diagnosis and that physician consultation for that very reason. Senator, and I believe in your heart you truly believe that, but I, I do wonder, do you think that the same doctors who currently are loose with their prescriptions might be loose with medical marijuana um, need diagnosis? I, I don't. Um, first of all, I'll give you a few reasons why. Um, it has to be a physician who's authorizing in an area of their expertise, okay? So it can't just be any doctor. It's got to be a physician. But a pain this management is, this doc is the, this doctor is their, can do it this all. This is their area. But, but the penalties that would accrue to a physician if a physician did not honor that written certification, and it's a very detailed written certification, the Board of Medical Examiners, and the bill also provides for that, has severe, has, has, has plenary disciplinary authority in regard to physicians who do not follow these protocols. And so, I mean, I, look, I can't speak to physicians and what they might do. I can just say that, you know, it's almost like a lawyer. I mean, a lawyer is not supposed to embezzle funds. Uh, you could get disbarred. The South Carolina bar is going to, you know, suspend you. Does that mean that there are some lawyers that, that will embezzle? Will embe does that mean that there will never be lawyers that embezzle funds? No, because they do. They do. So I can't say to you, simply because we have these requirements in the bill, that there aren't going to be physicians that take shortcuts. What I can say to you is there are severe penalties if they do so. Um, I don't see anywhere in your bill that would prevent a doctor from say, okay, look, we're going to have all these dispensaries. I'm going to come in and buy and set up shop right next door. Is there anything in your yeah, bill that would prevent that? Well, well, first of all, there's a direct prohibition from a physician having any financial interest or pecuniary interest right. in, a, in a dispensary. Um, I'll need to go back and look at the bill to see whether or not there is a requirement that they don't be in the same facility. Yeah, there um, is that that's in there, but just not that they can't just open up right next door. Okay. Well, okay. That's that's what the bill says. And then finally to Senator from Orangeburg's point regarding law enforcement and um, the ability for us to arrest and properly convict those who um, have had too much alcohol. We simply cannot do that with marijuana. I think you've already um, said that unless we get a blood draw. Same thing with opiates. No, but even, even with the blood draw, I think the point that the senator from um, Orangeburg was making is THC remains in your system sometimes for weeks. Okay, so, so I think the point that he was making was even in instances where you did a blood draw and there were, tra there were amounts of THC, you cannot reasonably infer from that 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 presence of the THC uh, was the result of some sort of an impairment while driving. It's, it's just a different, it breaks down much more slowly in your system than alcohol does. But, but what I would say is that same problem in regard to assessing whether or not somebody under, you know, under a prescription drugs is, is driving impaired, those same restrictions hold. And, and what I'm saying is the fact that it's, it's not, it's the fact that you can't measure it the same way you do blood alcohol isn't a reason not to pass this bill. If it were, it'd be a reason to do away with all these other medicines for which you can't determine the levels when somebody's driving impaired. And then the second point I would make is there are these field tests, these field sobriety tests, that, that even in, in, in cases of alcohol, if somebody doesn't want to take the, or, or blow the breathalyzer, they take them out there and they, 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 they prosecute cases based on what that field test is, right? So it's not like, I mean, it's not like they're not doing it already, but I frankly acknowledge you don't have that blood alcohol level tool with cannabis. We just don't yet. I agree with you, sir, about the level of THC because it can stay in the system for like a month. Right. However, there's a derivative that can be tested if you get a blood draw. And the same thing with opiates or other illegal stuff that can be detected, you can get a blood draw. Are you aware that other states have now had to fund phlebotomists so that they can take blood alcohol roadside? Utah being one, there are others. But um, that have you factored that in to potentially the expense? If there, well, in terms of the expense, um, in, in the case of every state that has medical cannabis laws, um, the revenue that is derived from it in every instance has been in excess of the cost 
to administer the program. So if anything, this is going to be a revenue enhancer. But to your point, if, if there are tests like that now, if there are blood tests like that now, that, that are properly and fairly determinative of somebody's level of impairment, I'll, I'll be happy to, to look at an amendment in that regard um, and to factor that into the fiscal impact. Yes, sir. Because, because I, look, I, I want this bill to be as tight and as regulated as possible. And, and I readily admit that although I've worked on this for seven years, there are things that I haven't emphasized that I should. The primary example being the pharmacist being the one to dispense. Until I took this well yesterday and heard from the senator from Charleston and the senator from Greenville, I, I, and the senator from Spartanburg as well, Senator Kimbrell, I didn't understand the depth of how important that was to have that degree of expertise there. So if there is some things that, that you're aware of because you are more involved in law enforcement than I am, I would welcome your expertise on that. Okay, we'll, we'll do. Interestingly, though, you brought up the fact that um, the revenue raised generally is going to outstrip any type of uh, deficit. Mm -hmm. Is it true that any revenue generator bill should originate in the House? Not if it's an ancillary thing to the underlying bill. And I've, I've researched this and talked about it with the clerk in drafting this bill. And the fact that there is a, a sales tax component that's designated to defray the cost of this program, um, it does not make it non-germane or does not subject a point of order because it's ancillary to the overriding intent of the bill. No, I'm not talking about it being germane. I'm talking about the Constitution of South Carolina says any revenue fundraiser is supposed to originate in the House. I don't think that's the proper reading of that constitutional provision. I think it has to do with whether or not a bill's intent is primarily a fundraising um, you know, if, if you know, that, that's my understanding. And in any event, um, you know, the constitutionality of it isn't something that, that we should discuss right here, right now. I don't I'm, not, I'm not trying to raise a point of order yeah. now. I certainly want you to go ahead and have a full and fair opportunity given your great and detailed work on this issue. Um, but I was just wondering if you, if you knew the answer to that question and figured that you would. Um, you also mentioned, though, that uh, in other states, the, the, the revenues are so high and therefore, like you said, outstrip any type of deficit. But are you aware that in Colorado, both the governor and the bill's sponsor both greatly regret um, their effort to uh, get marijuana into their areas, saying that they highly underestimated the black market? Because we will tax these things. I certainly will vote to tax it at every turn. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas the, the black market general pot dealers, you know, they do not. And therefore, it would be a lot easier, in, you know, to go on into other states and get, I mean, get, you know, people that are going to make brownies or going to make cookies. I know you're, you can't do regular pot under your bill. Um, it would be very easy just to go to the black market on that, wouldn't it? Yeah, and, and did you know that those comments were made, were made by them in the context of recreational use of marijuana, not medical? And, and I think that's always an important point for us to make here because you can throw out some statistics in regard to what the experiences of other states have been, recreational states, okay? I'm not defending the recreational or adult use of marijuana. And I would argue that it is not relevant or instructive to our debate here to look at what the experiences of states that have legalized it for adult use should be in regard to our very limited medical cannabis use. I think a more instructive thing to do is comparing it with other states that have had medical cannabis laws only and to look at what the data in those areas show us in regard to use. I agree with you, and that's to go to Senator Cash's point. In fact, I went over and mentioned to him that I continue to use Arizona as an example because they, like the other states that have followed the playbook, they go first to medical use, then they add different ailments that can be considered, you know, uh, part of the what the, they can use for medical use, and then they end up often in recreational. I used Arizona because they just recently, in fact, probably while I was out there, because you know Tahoe's in the middle of California and um, Arizona. Oh, no, that's Nevada. But I used Arizona because they just recently went recreational, I believe it is. And the 2021 data that I was using was prior to that implementation. Also, did you know, Senator, that... Well, me, well, can I respond to that? Yes. Um, again, it depends upon the citizenry of the state that you're talking about, okay? Arizonans aren't South Carolinians. South Carolinians aren't, aren't, aren't Californians. 
I mean, ultimately, the laws that we pass and the laws that we put in that code are reflective of what we as a General Assembly think are best representative of what the people of South Carolina want. So, so again, there are going to be some states that demographically are just more socially liberal than others. I would submit to you, South Carolina isn't that state. Um, and, and, um, I, and again, I can't predict what the future holds. What I can say is, I think that House members and Senate members are going to vote in their constituents' best interests. And knowing South Carolinians like I do, I just don't, there's not some inexorable force that's out there, extra legislative, that makes us do things like we're automatons in here to go ahead and do recreational because we pass medical. That's just not the way things work. And I understand that, and I accept that point. Um, but I, I would like to talk more about the statistics with Arizona because did you know that a lot of the states that have legalized marijuana did not, or for medical use did not mandate that their state keep statistics of what the ailments were that the card applications were given? And Arizona did. A lot of the other states were voluntary, so you're looking at voluntary data, which to me you may as well throw out of the, the room. But for the, for the states that have mandated that the physicians say why they are going to be giving this card to somebody, um, that would be important, don't you think, to see if we have some real data as far as ages of people doing this and what they're doing it for? I think it's important to have that data. Um, and, and again, I, I think what you're alluding to is the prevalence for um, applicants in Arizona getting it for chronic pain. And, and, and again... And they're young. Well, well, no, let's go through those statistics again, well, because again, that's just I not true. Hold I mean, on. All right, so there's 24.5 percent, 18 to 30. There is 21 percent of 41 to, to um, 50. There is 15 percent, 51 to 60. There is 15.5 percent, 65 to 70. 5.4 percent, 71 to 80, and and less, little less than 1 percent for 81 plus. So this this statement that a majority of them are predominantly young. I mean, the percentage of individuals under 50 is only 45 percent. The percentage of individuals under 30 is 24 percent. So, so that's just not a correct statement. Well, we must be. You're looking at a handwritten note that you, you're taking from somewhere. So maybe no, you and I'm, I can. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm taking you, it. I'm taking it from, and it's on my phone. That's getting charged over there. It's a screenshot from the from the Arizona state government website telling us who the users are and what their age groups so are. So maybe you and I'll get together after, sure. and we'll compare to make sure we're looking at the same data. Happy to do it. Okay. And then uh, last, I just want to go back to um, the senator from Orange Brooks questions when we're talking about blood draws and things of that nature. Um, uh, our officers, sure, they can do field sobriety tests. And this is going to be another issue that comes into play. They can do field sobriety tests all day long, but as a lawyer who regularly is in trial and dealing with stuff like this, um, it's very difficult to convict anybody if you don't have a camera rolling on that field sobriety test. And as we know, we have not properly funded cameras yet period. So there are a lot of agencies that it's going to be the officer's word versus, you know, a video camera of the person stumbling and, and not walking correctly. So, and then again, so can I, I mean, sure. I finish that thought. Um, since we're talking about the area of traffic safety and impaired driving, and I don't know if you were here yesterday when I had this conversation, that, that there are seven different studies, including one by the Department of Transportation, that have taken place over as long as a period of 20 years. And there is a direct correlation between authorizing cannabis for medical purposes and a decrease in overall impaired driving. And, and did you know that, that and you're smiling because it sounds counterintuitive, but, but again, we have experience of states that have passed medical marijuana laws and the DOT goes into explaining why this is the case, because in many instances, marijuana and alcohol are seen as substitute goods. And empirically, and, and the data shows that somebody who's getting behind the wheel driving with alcohol is much more reckless, much more likely to be unaware of their impaired condition than somebody who is operating on the influence of cannabis. That is not an argument in favor of getting high and driving a car. It is a statement of fact that if you're worried about fatalities, if you're worried about impaired driving, these studies comprehensively show that states that have authorized medical use, you've seen the number of those impaired driving cases go down. 
Okay, and so that's anyway. I just so to make I, that I was smiling out. because I have data indicating the direct opposite. So maybe so that you can for the benefit that. of the body, you and I can compare those notes so we can come to some type of agreement, perhaps. But um, my my question is. Are you aware that officers often cannot convict, even if it's an alcohol situation, if they don't have a blood alcohol? And in fact, we go ahead and we, we say you're not going to have your license if you're not going to if you're not going to go ahead and submit to test. Your bill also says if someone pulled over suspected of um, being on marijuana and, and high from marijuana, that uh, they can have some type, their, I guess their card revoked, there'll be some restriction or penalty on them for failing to take the test. Would that include, though, a blood draw? Not in this bill, no. And, and the reason for that is, Senator from Charleston, is a, a blood draw right now, at least my information is, isn't going to give you any meaningful information because THC can remain in your system for a long time and the presence of THC in your system may not be probative of whether or not you're driving impaired but for there, that reason. There are metabolites that are different, but it so does. you and I will talk about that yeah, over the sure. weekend too. Thank sure, you, but, sir. But anything, I mean, let me say this, kind of button this up. Anything that you can propose that empowers our law enforcement officials at that level to, to make these determinations and to prosecute successfully people who are driving impaired, I'm open to receiving. I understand. You've been very open for everything. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Stevens, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, uh, would the senator yield for a couple questions? Sure, Senator Yields. Senator Yields. Senator, do you know uh, through your uh, study and uh, compiling uh, data on the issue, not on the issue, but the prescribing of cannabis compared to morphine for those individuals with debilitating issues. Have we seen, have you seen any study that shows uh, what is more effective and uh, what is the outcome after those uh, therapeutic uh, drugs are, are injected into, well, not injected into the system, but swallowed into the system or rub onto the system? Yeah, there's, this, this is another, again, as I said before, we have the benefit of looking at what the experiences of states have been after adopting medical marijuana laws. Some have been in place for over two decades. And there have been numerous studies done in that regard. And, and what it shows, Senator from Orangeburg, is that there is a direct correlation between the availability of, of medical marijuana um, and a decrease in the use of opiates, opioids, and, and other prescription medicines of that type because it is a more effective way I would submit to address underlying pain. It has less side effects than, than taking those opioids do. And that's why you see a clear trend line in, in every study that's been done that, that when you have medical cannabis as an alternative, the number of opioid prescriptions go down, and more importantly, or as importantly, the number of opioid overdoses go down by, by, by material amounts, not by trace amounts, material amounts. So yes, there is data that shows that. Thank you, and, and thank you, Senator from Charleston, for, for doing my other questions. Thank you, Mr. President. S Senate, Senator from Greenville, Senator Loftus, what yield purpose do you? Senator, yield for a question. Senator, Senator from you questions. Yield. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned with my, the previous, my, the seatmate here were asking you questions about the doctors and doctor-patient relationship. Uh, and, and you went into great length to say it must be pain and must be diagnosed as that. Is it up to the doctor then to say, I think that, that cannabis is the right prescription for this? Yeah, and let me, um, let me just go to that. This is under the definition of debilitating medical conditions. Let me get the right section number so you can follow along um, at your desk. Um, it's in the definitions, subparagraph D, I believe. Qualifying conditions. What section? What section is that in? I'm, look, I'm looking for the. Uh, I'm looking for the section now. Um, I apologize. Give me a moment, and I'll find it. Which one is it? Uh, 
Okay, I got it now. It's um, section 44-53-2080. And, and I'll just go to that, that section now, and then as I'm working my way through the bill, I'll just skip it when we get there. But this is where you set forth um, what, a, what a physician has to sign and attest to um, before that physician can authorize use of cannabis by a patient. Um, and again, it's, it's section 44-53-2080, um, paragraph A3. And this, would have to, this is what the physician has to do. It has to certify that the physician and the patient have a bona fide physician-patient relationship as a prerequisite to any certification. In other words, it, it can't be a drive-by, it can't be somebody checking in, it's gotta be, uh, and, and bona fide relationship is defined in there as a physician who has an ongoing relationship with a patient. So that's the first thing that's certified. The second thing the physician has to certify is that the physician has consulted the prescription drug monitoring program established uh, pursuant to Article 15, Chapter 53, Title 44, to review the patient's controlled substance prescription history and has documented such consultation in the patient's medical record. Um, C, the physician has conducted an in-person evaluation and collected relevant clinical history commensurate with the presentation of the patient prior to issuing a written certification. At a minimum, that must include history of present illness, social history, past medical and surgical history, alcohol and substance abuse history, family history with an emphasis on addiction, mental illness, or psychotic disorders, a physical exam, and then a documentation of therapies with an adequate response. Moving on, the, the physician has to certify that, again, I'm quoting from the bill, that the patient has a debilitating medical condition, that the treatment of the debilitating medical condition or one or more symptoms of the debilitating medical condition or side effects of its treatment falls within the physician's area of practice, that's the, the specialty we talked about, identifying the patient's condition and that the symptoms or side effects of the condition or treatment could benefit from a certification for medical use of cannabis. Also, that the physician has developed a written treatment plan that includes a reviews of other measures, a review of other measures attempted to ease the suffering caused by debilitating medical condition that do not involve cannabis product for medical use, advice about other options for managing the debilitating medical condition, and advice about the potential risks of using medical cannabis products, um, including, and then it lists, um, you know, a, a list of the things that they have to consult. Um, uh, the, the, the importance of the quality and concentration of the cannabis product, the risk of cannabis use disorder, the potential exacerbation of psychotic disorders, and the adverse cognitive effects for children and young adults. Other adverse events, exacerbation of psychotic disorders, adverse con cognitive effects for children and young adults, and other risks. The risk of using cannabis during pregnancy or breastfeeding, the need to safeguard all products from children and pets and other animals. Um, and so, and then finally to your, your, your final point, um, Okay, so, so that's, that's in a general overview of that. And, and again, the intent of doing this in such detail is to avoid uh, the pill mills and, and, and just sort of the establishments that pop up simply for the uh, purpose of ex expediting a written authorization. We wanted this to be a thorough examination by a physician, um, a discussion of other uh, things that might have helped, a documentation that those other things did not help, I mean, so it's, again, it's pretty strict and it's pretty onerous, but I did not want us to pass a bill that was going to somehow lead to what the Senator from Charleston suggested is that in some areas you've seen these pill mills pop up. And so that's what I tried to guard against, we tried to guard against in drafting that section. When, when you read that, Senator, and I know you, you, you have a a requirement of a uh, doctor-patient relationship there and history, history of that patient. But does it entail any drugs that have been given that patient? Yeah, one of the, one of the requirements is, is that... And I'm talking about drug for pain. 
I understand. And, so forth. That, and one of the requirements is that the physician has consulted the prescription drug monitoring program established pursuant to Article 15, Chapter 33, Title 44, to review the patient's controlled substance prescription history. So, so, so I, I would say in that regard, there is a requirement that a physician access that information and then using that information, put him or herself in a position where he or she can advise the patient about whether cannabis is, is, is right as a medical response. What I'm getting at, there's, um, there's three products on the market that's cannabis-based. One is a... Uh, uh, Epidiolex. Beg your pardon? Epidiolex is one. Yeah, well, there's three of them. And one of them's uh, synthetic, I think. Yeah. Uh, I find it interesting that proponents, many proponents of these bills, says, I've tried everything, nothing else works. And I really wonder, with three drugs on the market out there that address this, and I know all drugs are diff a little different and affect different people in different ways. But I find it interesting that there's nothing in this bill that, that says you first have to try. Now, you're going to review that. Maybe, they've, maybe it's in the review. Yeah, they and, and this it's, up. it expressly and, states in the review that there, there's, they, they have to document that prior medications and treatments but, have not provided the relief. That, that's one of the things that a, a physician certifies to having gone through in, in before he issues or she issues this authorization. But if there's limited information that you were talking about, people just walking in and saying, I'm in severe pain, I need, I need this, I, I get that. Um, but to what extent does a doctor's opinion go first, for instance, say, well, we're going we're gonna to try cannabis. We're going to try medical marijuana outside if there's no substantial in, uh, uh, record of other pain medications or something that, that tries to resolve the condition that the patient is complaining about. I, I guess I would go back and say, Senator from Greenville, that there is a requirement that the physician consults this drug monitoring program that we've established to review, quote, the patient's controlled substances prescription history. So, so that's information the doctor has to access and to understand and discuss with the patient before you get to the end result of certification. I mean, so, so again, I take your, I take your point, um, but, but what I would say also about those, those three drugs that have been approved that have THC or components of THC, the reason why you don't see um, some, some people benefit from it, and that's fine, but the reason why a lot of people do not benefit from it is, is, is again, cannabis uh, and the oils we're talking about here are going to be comprised of varying ratios of THC to CBD because everybody's endocannabinoidal system is different. That you don't have that variation or method of trial and error to figure out what works and doesn't work with those drugs that you've mentioned. What you do have with this bill and with the cannabis oil that it would legalize is the patient then has information in regard to the ratios of THC and CBD and, and in consultation with what I think ultimately is going to be a pharmacist, because I think that's what we're working on, figuring out what works and what's right for that patient because you react differently, okay? Those three drugs you just mentioned are static in terms of their percentages of THC or CBD. I think the important therapeutic thing to understand here is everybody's endocannabinoidal system is different and they're gonna require different ratios of THC to CBD um, in order to get the therapeutic benefits. I guess that, that's how I would respond to that. So you're telling me that in this bill, according to the allowances of the amount of TCB, TCPs in there, um, that it is, are you telling me that it's stronger than, some of it is stronger than what's on the market right there in those three medications? Yeah. What, what, what'll happen, Senator from Greenville, is, is um, and it does establish some caps in that dosing language I read, it establishes some caps in regard to the percentage of THC, okay, in terms of milligrams. But, but what you're gonna see um, is, is, is markets working, okay, uh, as, as certain, ratios of THC to CBD have become demonstrably more effective than others, you're likely to see those that grow adjust what they grow to correspond with what the market is sending a signal with in terms of what's efficacious. I mean, so, so there's going to be records kept by uh, whoever dispenses in regard to what's been dispensed and what ratios. And 
you can derive from that, you know, what's the most effective for certain things. And so I'm guessing, I'm just, this is how markets react. I mean, if, if you're a dispensary and, and if the history of it is saying uh, uh, a ratio of THC at this level and CBD at this level is really, really effective in regard to helping people with PTSD, you're likely to see that signal go back to growers and they're going to generate more uh, cannabis medicine that corresponds with those ratios. So, so that's going to be a dynamic process back and forth. But the bill, the bill allows for that to occur. The bill allows for growers to generate product that have different ratios between CBD and THC. So, um, and, and that's for two reasons. Well, the primary reason is there is a degree of, of, of trial and error at the dispensing level uh, necessarily, because somebody doesn't know how their body is going to react to cannabis until they take it. Uh, you mentioned a lot about pharmacists helping a person decide what is best for them. Um, I think that was one of the best, the best things to come out of the debate yesterday, and, and your, my conversation prior to that was, how do we get that skill um, that pharmacists possess into that critical area of, of, you know, in between when an authorization is given by a doctor and when the patient accesses that cannabis product. And, 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 and I think some well, very good points were made that we want to have that skill set there because that's what pharmacists do. Pharmacists counsel their patients on medications and, and, and what, the, what the side effects might be or what the therapeutic value might be. And, and, and what you're going to see over time are pharmacists becoming more conversant with those kind of discussions in the medical cannabis context, because that's what they'll be taking continuing education courses in regard to. That'll be the experience they derive from working with patients. You're gonna get a very robust, I think, class of professionals there at a, critical, at a critical spot. I guess what concerns me there, who takes priority, the doctor writing the prescription? And you don't call it a prescription, but um, a doctor writing that or the pharmacist? The and it sounds like it's the pharmacist well, rather than the doctor. Well, the doctor in the first instance in terms of authorization, okay? But, but, but then after that's authorized and the patient takes a certification and gets the cannabis, there's a requirement for a follow-up with that doctor. And so there's an opportunity there for the doctor to have the conversation with the patient as well. So, um, you know, how it works in practice, I guess it varies on individuals. Some individuals are comfortable working with their pharmacist in regard to that. Some might want to go back and talk to their doctor about it. So I, I don't know, but, but there'd be the opportunity to do, certainly the opportunity to do both, and the obligation um, and, and the initial uh, authorization to go back to the doctor and have that meeting too, because I, I wanted there to be that feedback loop between after authorization by a physician and after the, the dispensary dispenses the medical cannabis, that it then go back to the doctor so the doctor has an opportunity to actually assess you know, what has happened. And, and, and that was built into this bill at the request of the South Carolina Medical Association because they wanted that doctor more involved in that process. One of the things that does concern me along, along that, and this comes from personal experience, uh, is pharmacists not writing prescriptions that a doctor has written. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, barbiturates. I'm not talking about painkillers and that sort of thing that are, that are addictive, that are controlled substances. My own personal experience ran low on a prescription I'm taking. Had nothing to do with any kind of painkiller or anything like that. And the pharmacist says, well, we're going to have to talk to the doctor before we can authorize this. And, and I was going, I had gotten low on the medication. We were going away for a few days. So, so that I was uh, without. Didn't kill me, obviously. But it frustrates me that the pharmacist would have so much power over a doctor in writing a prescription. I can understand it if it's opioids. I can understand it if that doctor has a history of writing uh, prescriptions uh, for this sort of thing. But I don't understand why we're giving pharmacists so much authority that it precedes the, the doctor's recommendation. Uh, and the pharmacist training, which I know they have a lot, and they know a lot by experience, that and, and the, the uh, education that, that, that doctors get, that, that really concerns me uh, that that is happening right now. And um, well, two, two, re two responses to that, and it reminds me to say this, that you've got to get an authorization from a doctor on an annual basis, okay? So it's, it's not like you get an authorization to access cannabis for your medical condition, and that's it. 
So we've got built into this, you got to go back to that physician, and each time the physician has to do a new analysis, a new assessment, and, and, and certify it all over again. So, so we're not cutting the doctor out of the process once that first authorization is made. He or she is going to be involved by virtue of that annual recertification, so to speak. The, the, the second thing I would, I would say is, um, uh, in, in regard to pharmacists having, having a lot of control or, or a lot of power, um, and, and there's some, I understand the point you're making, and, and the reason that is in the cannabis context, unlike maybe with some prescription drugs, is because at that level, at that consumption level, in terms of getting, you know, what kind of medical product are you going to get, what ratios, there is going to be a period of trial and error in figuring out which ratios of CBD to THC interact with your endocannabinoidal system in an effective way. And so you're right. that There is going to be um, a lot of um, power. I don't know if the power is the right word, but a lot of control at that level by a pharmacist. And so that was one of the things that persuaded me as I started to think about it and as you asked me these questions why I wanted to have a pharmacist there, because this is what pharmacists do. They're, they're, they're trained to talk to patients about how they're interacting with medicines. They're, they're, they're trained to talk about, you know, how does it address the underlying conditions. And so um, all I can say is excellent point in that regard, and, and quite frankly, I wish it had been built into the bill earlier. But again, that's one of the good things about Florida Bait is you get good ideas. Well, in, in my particular case, it, it was not an, uh, and actually in most medications, you're required to, to have an annual update on that, on the medication, just any type of medication. Yeah, and, and I primarily. just wanted to emphasize that, Seth, from Greenville, because I didn't want the inference to be that, that once the doctor makes that initial certification, he or she's out of the equation, it, they're going to be involved right. in it on, a, on an annual routine basis by statute. Right, I, and I understand that, but in, in my case, it has nothing to do with this, this particular bill except an experience with, uh, with a pharmacist. By the way, there's a mention in here on, on, on tele, uh, uh, telemedicine. Um, this does, is a physical exam required, a face-to-face -face physical exam? That, that, I didn't. It is, and, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons, I mean, again, um, people ask me for examples of why, how is this tightly controlled? How is this more regulated? How is this more conservative? That's another example of why. You have to have that inpatient, one-on-one, -on -one physical interaction between patient and physician. Um, and that's not to denigrate tele telemedicine. I think telemedicine is extraordinarily important. I think it's opened up healthcare access to a whole range of people. But, but in regard to this, for right now, again, taking this cautious first step forward, I wanted there to be that physical immediacy between the patient and the physician. Um, and that's why that was included that way in the bill. You mentioned in the, in the bill that other agencies will be used for whatever expertise they can give. And we talked about this thing is going to be supposedly self-supporting. Where's the money coming from and how is it going to be um, attributed to those particular agencies that might be involved in whether research or whatever they might be doing? Yeah, it... Um, how, would, how do we di differentiate that? A couple of different ways. Um, uh, First of all, there is a 6% a sales tax Agree. on the sale of the cannabis. There is also a, an authorization mechanism in the bill for DHAC to establish a system of registration fees um, if you want to be licensed as a grower, if you want to be licensed as a processor, if you want to be licensed as a dispenser, if you want to be licensed as an independent lab that, that tests, if you want to be licensed as somebody who's authorized to transport. And, and they have been instructed to come up with a fee schedule to be commensurate with what it's going to cost them to administer the program. Now, in fairness, there's going to be some startup costs, okay, um, that probably will have to be funded out of the general fund because until you have the program up and running, you don't have those, you know, fees coming in from applicants for licenses. You don't have that, that sales tax revenue coming in from the sale of, of medical cannabis. So there's going to be a period of fiscal impact to the general fund as this program gets up and running. I guess the point that I was making, Senator Loftus, is that in the states that have adopted medical cannabis laws, once those laws have been put into place and, and, and markets are working and monies are being paid, they are self-sustaining in terms of mitigating the cost of administering the program. That, that was my point there. And, and, and ultimately, over time, as it becomes um, you know, more robust in terms of its use, 
the experience in the other states has been it's an actual net revenue generator. Um, now, you know, every state's experience is going to vary, but, but I think the fact that that has occurred in all these other states is instructive as to what we can expect here. I didn't, I don't think I missed it, any fees in it. What, what is a startup fee if you want to be a grower or a processor or you want to open a dispensary? That's, that is left to DHEC to, to establish through regs because um, what DHEC needs to do is to, is to kind of look at what it considers its ongoing costs are going to be, aside from the upfront costs. There's going to be upfront costs that we're going to have to pay for out of the general fund in terms of, of, um, of equipment or in terms of you know, uh, um, computers or registries or whatever it might be. And you don't have any idea what that might be? I, I don't know, but what I can tell you is we've given authority to DHEC to come forward with proposed fees that are designed to defray those costs. Um, and only defray those costs, because I, I've not drafted this bill as being a revenue raiser for the state. I, I have drafted it so that it's going to be net neutral in terms of revenues. Now, we may decide that, you, that we want to change that, but the reason I did that was a lot of these medications are going to have to be purchased by patients out of pocket. They're not covered in insurance policies, and I didn't want to go ahead and establish a fee schedule that was going to make access prohibitive. So you are depending on fees, et cetera, and, and uh, to, to run the operation. And the sales tax. The sale, will all the sales tax, sales tax go into that? It not, tax, not into the general fund? Yeah, the, the way that it works, the way that it's designed, and we adopted this in the committee amendment, um, it goes, uh, all the revenues go first to the cost of administering the program. And if there is any excess, it then goes um, as follows. Um, one, 3% of that access for research conducted by the University School of Medicine and MUSC. 2% of any excess goes to local providers operating under the auspices of Act 301 of 1973 for the purposes related to alcohol and drug abuse prevention, education, and early intervention. 3% of any excess of monies needed to administer the program goes to SLED. 2% to the South Carolina Department of Education to be used for drug safety ed education. And then after all of that, if there still is excess revenue, that then goes into the, the general fund. So, so the way that it's set up is that the revenues that are generated, which will be primarily through two, for, two sources, fees established by DHAC and the sales tax on the sale of cannabis at that point of sale, goes to the, defray the cost of administering the program by the agencies, and then any excess is allocated the way I've just outlined. Yesterday, you showed us uh, some surveys and everything that you did. I believe you said there were 300 people involved. Did you, how, how many surveys did you do? Um, well, this survey was done by um, Starboard Communications. I don't know who they actually retained to do the, the callings and whatever. Um, and um, that was done from December 28 to December 30 and done primarily because one of the criticisms was um, earlier questions were unfairly loaded, or earlier questions um, you know, you know, um, pushed people in certain directions. And so in talking with them, I said, I want one, just a bold statement. Are you for or against legalizing medical marijuana? And, and that's what they did. But then I said what I would like is I want these three negative pushes SLED opposes, family council opposes, arguments that it might lead to recreational. And then I wanted the three positive pushes, can help people with PTSD, can help people who have, who have cancer and are suffering from chemotherapy, um, uh, can reduce opioid um, uh, addictions or use. And the reason I did that was I wanted you to see the effect of both those negative and positive pushes. And you could see them. Um, and in terms of once people understand even more, well, first of all, just the, the straight out question, they still prefer it. But when they understand more about it, both, you know, the, the opponents and the, the, the positive aspects, the numbers scoot up to over 70% approve and around 20% disapprove. And my point there is that as you educate people as to the medical properties of cannabis and, and as they become familiar with its use in, in, in treating conditions, the, popular, the, the people's acceptance of it grows. And, and you see that across the board. Um, and, and anyway, that was the purpose of putting that up there was, 
I wanted this body to understand where I think the data shows the people of South Carolina are. Because ultimately, we're up here, I think, to fashion laws that as closely as possible correspond with what our constituents want. And, um, and, and so that's why I presented that information. Now, the reason I ask that, if it is all how the question is put forth, if, if you were to ask if a person is dying with cancer, would you be willing to allow uh, cannabis uh, for that to survive longer? The answer, chances are most of the time, and the majority is gonna be yes. And, and, that's why, and that's why I felt it was important just to put that, first of all, just that bald statement out there without any qualifiers, without anything else. But then separately, I did the pushes. The, the th not I did, the, the pollster did. Three positive, three negative. So this body could be informed as to what is it that moves people? Because that's an important thing too. Not only the baseline, but, but the information is if you knew this about that and then observing what their behavior would be. And as you could look at that, very little change in terms of how they felt um, with sled opposition or Pam out of family council opposition or the fear it might lead to recreational. Very uh, nominal, if any, movement. But then the movement was off the charts when, it, when, when you told them it could help people with PTSD or get off of opioids or, or help with, with, with MS and cancer. And I think that's instructive because what that says is this is where people will be as they learn more about medical cannabis. Let me ask one other question. What geographic area was that covered? The entire state. All over from, in, from in, in, because in, you, made, you made statements that upstate was a little more conservative than the low state, that something was, to that, that effect? That was a, a subjective observation I was making about what I think about the I think you're correct on that. But. Well, I think that's right. But, but if you, to answer your question directly, um, the poll was, um, as all good polls are, and this is a good poll, reputable poll, is properly representative of geographic regions, properly representative of weightings between Republican and Democrat, to give you the best idea possible about what South Carolinians think about this. Are yeah. all polls perfect? No, of course not. There's gonna be variations, four to five points, deviations. But, but one of the things that, that leads me to believe, Senator from Greenville, that, that this is correct, is that it bears out what numerous of polls have showed over time, done by different institutions. Winthrop University, as far back as five or six years ago, was doing a poll showing that a majority of South Carolinians favored medical cannabis laws, so, uh, and empowering doctors and helping patients. So, you know, you've just seen that number move over time, and I think that's a function of people becoming more aware of what the therapeutic value of cannabis might be. Because, look, as I said back in 2014, before I had that Rotary Club meeting and, and my constituent came up to me and talked about her granddaughter with epilepsy, I had never thought about marijuana in the context of medicine. I mean, it just wasn't on my radar screen. Um, and, um, and, and, and digging into that, that's what really kind of exposed me to this other argument. And, and, um, and I recognize that for a lot of people, as I said earlier in, the, in this chamber, you're really engaging on this for the first time. I mean, because everybody's busy, everybody's on different committees, um, and, I, and I respect that. So that's why I've tried to kind of walk through in as much detail as I can, and then along the way to give you the reasons why I did things or why this bill has been shaped the way that it is. And, and that's, you know, ultimately that's all that I can do. And then ultimately this body will vote on, on whether or not it should pass or not. And, and I'll live with whatever that result is because However this body decides, that's, in their opinion, reflective of what their constituents want. And I would never begrudge anybody that right. Well, did you know I have, I have followed holistic medicine and other things for quite, quite some time, for, for many years. I had two uh, customers back before I retired from insurance um, that were um, taking cancer treatment, chemotherapy. And I don't know where they got a hold of marijuana, but they did, and it was effective. So I have looked at this. I have, do have compassion with it. I do understand that. And, and you made the statement, if it were your child, what would you do? Parents would give them their, parents would take their place of their child if they could. And you know that. And, uh, but, but the other aspect we've got to consider is effect on the whole of society. And so there's two, two equations to this. To, to this question, unfortunately. And, and, I, and, and I take your point. Your, your, your point is we're being utilitarian in some way here. We're, we're, we're looking at the goods and we're looking at the bads. And, and ultimately, I have a certain view on, on what those goods are. 
and, and, and others may have different views, and they'll have to decide where they come down in that balancing. And I am not arrogant enough to say that my view is the only right one. The best I can do is to lay out what I've done, explain why I did it, answer the questions that you ask me, so that this body feels like it's in a position to make that assessment. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator going Tiffin, back to Senator the, from Pickens, what purpose do you rise? I see if Senator will yield for a question. Of course. Senator yields for a question. I've been listening for two days, and I have a question that I was going to wait and see if you covered it, and you may cover it before it's over with, but I'm thinking about business that I'm in, uh, thinking about truck drivers, CDL truck drivers that are coming out of other states. Uh, right now, you have to do random testing on CDL truck drivers. If they have a certificate uh, that allows them to purchase whatever the product is, wherever it is, uh, and they use it this week, next week they're going to test positive. What, what do we do about that? How do we handle that? Yeah, the Trucking Association asked that, and in fact, if I can find the, um, the language, but we included language in here um, that would give the association authority to prohibit that. What? I mean, it, in other words, the, the right to access medical cannabis, even if it's given by a doctor and authorization and taking it, doesn't trump the right of, of that trucking line or that service to say, I'm sorry, we're, we, we don't allow that here. In other words, it's not an overriding right. So the truck driver, if you're, if you're employed in the transfer, and if you go to page 21 in there, that's probably going to, if, that, if you got the same document that my seatmate's got over here, that's probably going to be where we address that. So it sounds like to me, if you've got a CDL driver's license and are employed in the transportation business, uh, you may even be a bus driver for the school district, that your certificate, that those people cannot get anything. They can't get any product. They, they might get the product, but they, they would be subject to discharge um, or being fired if they had it, I mean, if, if that were against those regulations. So if they test positive, they can be terminated, even though they have they, a certificate. They could. And, and, and that was one of the things we also did, not just in regard to trucking and, and bus drivers and whatever, any business, okay, any business, and this was at the request of the Chamber of Commerce, any business that wants to establish a drug-free workplace, any business that wants to, it has, it is sovereign in that workspace. And, and the only way I can think of it is, um, um, well, I'll just say this. Um, you do not have a right, even though you have a certification from a doctor saying you can take medical cannabis, you do not have a right to go against what an employer's policies might be. You are subject to discharge. That is not a right that supersedes the right of the, workplace, the, the employer to control the workplace. So, and what I've run into in the past is, obviously somebody comes in and tests positive this week, they say, well, I didn't do anything this week, I did it last week, but I still tested positive. You're saying the employer can terminate? It's the employer's, I mean, and, unless there's something in their handbook and they, they, they've got a contract, but if you're talking about an at-will employment context, which is what we, we mostly are, you could absolutely discharge them for that reason. Right. Thank you. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise, sir? See if the senator will yield for a question. Senator yields. Se senator yields for a question. Senator, I'm not intending to go off on my whole list of questions. I just, I do sure. want to clarify this point. Sure. It is uh, section 4453-2140. The last paragraph, which is paragraph D, says the department may not issue a registry identification card to a person who is employed in public safety, commercial transportation, or the operation of commercial machinery, which means that if a even if a truck driver goes and gets a certificate from a physician, when he takes that certificate to get his registration card, uh, he should not be allowed to get the card. I mean, that's clearly what it, the You're language right, states here. That, that's the way it's phrased, and as I recall now, that was put in there at the request of SLED. Um, they, they wanted that in there as a prohibition. So I'm, you're right. I misspoke when I said if you get a registry card, that doesn't trump um, an employer's right to um, um, have a drug-free workplace. That, that is preeminent. But you're right. In the context of, of 2140, when you're talking about what was it, the um, uh, law enforcement and... Um, Public safety, commercial transportation, yeah. and the operation of commercial machinery. You simply cannot get the That's, card. And you're correct. That's an outright ban on that one. You're correct. 
Senator from Greenville, Senator Loftus, what purpose do you ask? You would uh, he with this senator yield for course. another no, I, couple of questions? Senator Sen yields uh, yield for question or questions. That conversation spurred some other questions for me. Okay. One is how do you with this last question with the representative Anderson, uh, Senator from Anderson, uh, how are you going to track? The, how is that tracked? In terms of whether or not they're employed in that status, so right. that. Um, um, it would have to be because DHEC is ultimately the one that um, authorizes or issues the registry cards. That's the, that's the, I mean, they're the ones that, that issue the card. Do they have to check what then yeah. the employment of that person? Or? You're, make, you're making a good point in, in that if we're going to have, and, and um, we have people making notes, if you're going to have as a prescription against accessing medical cannabis, individuals in certain industries in the statute, there has to be a mechanism whereby an agency that's involved in the authorization knows what that employment status is. I'll need to look back and see whether or not that information is included. I think it might be because there's a list of, of, of a, of, and I'll get to it in a moment, there's a questionnaire that the patient has to fill out and submit to DHEC. I think it may have on there, it may have in there employment status or how they work, but, but as I go through this bill, I'll flag that in my mind and, and come back to you on that. The other question that comes up is HIPAA. Does the employer have a right to ask an employee if they are using any controlled or non-controlled substance? My understanding is that a, a, an employer, um, as a matter of law, has the right to impose the restrictions it wants, whether it's urinalysis tests, whether it, whatever it might be, that that is the employer. And again, the point I'm tr I was trying but to they're make, asking about medical history. Actually, yeah, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I guess the, the the I guess the point that I'm getting to here is, and sitting down with the chamber and using their language, they wanted to make sure that somehow the employer's right to control that workplace environment wasn't going to be trumped by an individual's right to take medical cannabis. And so it, we included into this, into, this, into this bill language that makes it clear that a person's holding of that card does not trump that employer's right to control that workplace. If an employee is using this product, well, if they were, supposedly they're not going to be, re, they will be rejected if they're a, operating a, a vehicle or something, big vehicle, or that sort of thing. But if they get past that, they're involved in an accident, the, the liability claims is, are still there against the company and everything, correct? Yeah, I think in terms of... There's, um, no, there's, no, there's no leniency there. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're acting within the scope of your employment, that your, your actions can right. be attributed back. Even though the employer, employer has no knowledge of it, correct? I think that's probably right. All right. Senator from Charleston, Senator Sin, what purpose do you ask? To see if the senator would yield for a few questions. Yes, ma'am. Senator, yes. Um, so I'm looking back through your bill, and after listening to the testimony of my seatmate, um, or his questions, and you indicated that telemedicine was not enough, that somebody would have to be seen face-to-face, -face, patient would have to be face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. um, in looking back through it, I do see that the patient, at least initially, would have to come in face to face, but I don't see anything that says that the doctor has to fact check, for instance, what was the underlying cause. It looks to me like the patient can fill out a form, tell the doctor these things, tell the doctor whether he's had mental health issues, tell the doctor, you know, what his debilitating injury is, and the doctor could simply accept that and then put it in his records. Do you see in the, anything in different? The in, in the initial authorization or in the yes. renewal? Well, the renewal, I think, can be telemedicine, can it? Right. I'm talking about in terms of that initial authorization. Yeah, the initial. Um, but, again, it's very, in, in terms of what that doctor has to certify, Sarah from Charleston, it is the doctor's analysis, not, not just, I mean, of course you've got to communicate with the patient and you've got to hear what the patient is saying. I mean, that's critical to any diagnosis a, pa a physician makes. But at the end of the day, in that certification, it is that physician that is certifying those things. It's, right. it's not just simply, you know, cutting and pasting whatever the patient says. Um, and, and if, in the event, I go back earlier, 
If a physician doesn't discharge those very specific duties, he or she is subject to sanctions by the Board of Medical Examiners. Well, now, that, that, that's my next question, yep. but let, let me go back up on this, mm -hmm. because what I just read it over again, it does not appear that he has any duty to check what other meds the guys or girls are on, um, what type, if there was an x-ray or anything like that, it says they can, but there is no duty to do that. The physician could simply get someone to fill out a form, certify them, put them in a, put it in a file, and after that, they can have a telemedicine relationship. Is that right? No, I don't think so. Let me hold on. Let me pull uh, up the section here. It's going to be 4453-2260. Hold on. Let me pull the... Say it again, Wait, uh, no, Senator no, Charles. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I gave you the wrong section. Okay, I've got I've got it now. Um, it's section 44-53-2080, okay. talking about the written certification that a physician has to issue prior to authorizing. Um, a, um, uh, a patient to access uh, medical cannabis. Yes, I um, agree and, that and he has to certify, but there's nothing that says what can constitute the certification. Um, My um, point is if you have CD um, medical providers, they can simply say, hey, dude, have you ever taken any other kind of medicines? Do you have a mental health problem? Why does your knee hurt? Um, that's okay. No, no, no. Section 44-53-2080-A3 says that a physician must sign a statement and attest to it and sign it with the following provisions. That the physician has done this. They have, they have a bona fide patient-physician relationship. That the physician has consulted the prescription drug monitoring program. That the physician has conducted an in-person evaluation and collected relevant clinical history, including history of present illness, whatever, all those things. That the patient has a debilitating medical condition. That the physician has developed a written treatment plan. I mean, these are all declarative duties that a physician has. And then he signs a certification saying that it is true. Now, if you're asking me, are there going to be some physicians that, that, that takes shortcuts and that simply cut and paste and take whatever the, the patient says, I can't get into that physician-patient room and tell you with 100% certainty what's going to happen. What I can tell you is this section is very declarative in regard to what a, a, a physician has to do or he or she is subject to penalties. It's not discretionary. It's not they can do it if they want to. It's, it is what they have to do and certify to in writing. I'm, I'm trying to make sure we're in this in the right spot because I am looking at... I just read you the spot where it establishes the duty. You said 2380? It's 44-53-2080, paragraph 20. A, it's so the paragraph 3. Okay, it gives the minimum standards, but I don't see anything that indicates that this doctor can't just take what the, the patient says as true. Well, Senator from Charleston, it, I don't know how else you can say it other than to say a physician must have a written statement attested to that by a physician saying that he or she has done this. I mean, if you, if you want to put in some... Right, but his qualif the qualification could be, I have asked the patient, he said this, and I'm going to certify that the person has a hurt knee. I would submit to you that's not how this language reads, that this language is very detailed in regard to the diagnoses that a physician has to make. But if you feel like there needs to be other language put in there that makes it more declarative in regard to what a physician has to do, I'm open to amendments in that regard. I, I, I feel like it's fairly clear. I think that somebody looking at this section would conclude that it's clear. But I'm not going to argue with you if I, if I want to get your vote. Um, if, if you don't think it's clear enough, offer up an amendment, and if it does make it clear, I'll support you. Very good. So I see where doctors will have to go to a three-hour course to start prescribing marijuana. Um, would that, and, and that, in your view, is enough for doctors who don't prescribe marijuana to figure out what type, what, you know, all of that kind of stuff, three hours? Um, 
A lot of states don't have any, but, but we put that in there at the request of the South Carolina Medical Association. And it's not just the one course, it's an annual uh, three-hour course in, in the therapeutic benefits of medical cannabis. Well, if, you feel like, if you feel like some other um, layer is necessary in order to make a physician competent to make a diagnosis, I can look at that amendment. I can just tell you that is what we came up with in talking to the South Carolina Medical Association and what they felt like an appropriate time would be. So also in looking at some of these subsections, I see that you're giving physicians immunity. Immunity for being sued for malpractice. No, um, that's all, not true. That's not, that's not the case. 44, 53, yep. 2290, and yep. then there's another section. Hold on. Yep. I'll, I'll get to that because I remember discussing this. What's, I'm sorry, Senator Charleston, what section were you looking at? I think it's 2290, but there's another one. Hold on. Two ninety and forty four fifty three twenty ninety subsection B. Okay, here's how it reads. A physician may not be sued for medical malpractice as a result of certifying a qualifying patient's medical use of cannabis products in accordance with this article. However, the immunities provided by this section shall not be construed to prevent a physician from being penalized or sued for violating the standard of care or for any violation of this article, including certifying a person for medical cannabis products who does not have a debilitating medical condition. So in other words, we are not creating a carve out from having to conform with what the, um, um, the um, standard of care um, for a physician. What we're saying is, that simply as a matter of qualifying somebody for a condition, that is not sufficient in and of itself to sue a physician for malpractice. However, if you can demonstrate that the physician did not do that examination correctly, did not make the, the, the right diagnosis, did not complete that certificate in good faith, violated the standard of care, that that doctor can be sued for malpractice. And, 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 and so to say that there's immunity from malpractice isn't correct. You gotta read the rest of that sentence. Okay, well, I did, and then I'm looking back over here, 4453-2090, subsection B. Again, it talks about a physician not being subject to being arrested or anything else with respect to um, issuing these certifications. Now, what about if they What, what section was that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's 4453-2090-B. 90B. Right. A physician is not subject to arrest by state or local law enforcement, a prosecution or penalty under state or local law um, for or providing written certification. That's simply a recognition that if this law passes, it is legal for a physician to authorize medical cannabis use by patients if that physician complies with all those requirements. It's, it's not illegal under state law. And then let's get to the medical standard. The doctor's going to know the medical standard based on three hours of education that's going to be given by the board of medical examiners at some point. I think that the you know I think it's a matter of fact as to what the standard of care that's required in any given circumstance is. So this isn't I mean that three hours of medical education doesn't provide a physician with a safe harbor from being subjected to a malpractice claim. It is simply a statutory requirement because we believe it's in the public interest of South Carolinians for these physicians to have that training, but it doesn't go to creating a safe harbor in regard to the standard of care. If I mean, marijuana is a medicine, mm -hmm. is there any other medicine that you can think of where the statute that allows it and enables it provides immunity from, for doctors for prescribing? It doesn't provide them with, well, it provides them with immunity. It's not illegal per se, and it's not malpractice per se, but it goes on to say that you are still subject to the standard of care. So if it turns out that you have authorized the use of cannabis by a patient 
And if it turns out that that was completely wrong, that this person had a history of mental illness or a tendency towards schizophrenia or any number of things, you can be sued for malpractice because you have not discharged your requirements under that certification. So it doesn't create a safe harbor, but what it does say is that in and of itself does not constitute evidence of malpractice. I am confused as to how we can deny um, people who have been, I guess, given these medicines, since they are medicines, the right to take them. Um, and I understand that you've carved some things out uh, with respect to employers where they're truck drivers, and I think, I think even CWP holders are not supposed to have it, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a concealed weapon, you can't get your medicine. Um, police officers. I saw in one section where police officers and first responders are automatically entitled to get a diagnosis of PTSD just by virtue of the fact that they're first responders. Yet, then you say that the employers can mandate that they not, um, first because they have a, a weapon, but you know that they're also first responders and they need to be cognizant. How can we deny people Medicine. You know, there's two, two parts to your question, and I'll answer the first one. Um, I have certain CLE requirements as a lawyer every year um, that I have to take. That in no way mitigates my duty to provide a degree of competence to my clients. Okay, So that's the first point I would make. It's, it's, it's a requirement, but it is not an insulation from liability. Secondly, as I was saying to the Center from Greenville, what we're doing here in this bill is we're weighing the rights or the ability to give patients access to medicine and what that entails and the benefits there. And we're looking at the other side of the scale with some of the societal consequences might be. Um, workplace, you know, taking away control of workplace might be one of those consequences. This is the balance that I've struck, okay, or that we've struck in committee in regard to how do we weigh those competing things. Is there let any me, other, me, me I'm finish, sorry, my, yes sir. My answer. So, so, so as we go about crafting a bill like that, there's a whole myriad of things that come into the equation and engagement with the Chamber of Commerce and with SLED and with others. This is the balance that we struck in terms of providing access to patients who need the medicine as opposed to what some of the competing societal um, considerations were. Um, this is the, the balance that was struck there. It is not an absolute, as you point out. Um, it is a striking of a balance there. Um, and, and ultimately, that's what we do in passing laws, because every law that we pass has an impact on something else, and you have to weigh the relative merits of each. That, that's what we've attempted to do here. Is there any other medicine that you're aware of that can be denied individual classes of people? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know whether or not um, uh, opioids or opiates or certain prescription drugs um, I mean, certainly in a private employer co employment context, there's going to be restrictions in that regard. I guess your question to me is, is there one in statute? Um, I'll, I'll have to check and see. I'm not aware of one. But, but again, the reason that that exists here um, is to balance those two competing things. And, and some may agree that I've, I've sided too much on the side of, of what law enforcement wanted or what the trucking industry wanted or what the Chamber of Commerce wanted. Some others might say I cited too much on the side of individuals having the right to access medicine. We've done the best job we could in trying to reconcile those competing societal uh, interests. So I'm, I'm just curious, though. I understand that you're, you're trying to please everybody, but I'm worried that it runs afoul of... I'm not trying to please everybody. What I'm trying to do is balance. listen to everybody, understand their concerns, and then, as lawmakers must do, decide how you're going to come down and striking that balance. So I'm not going to, in fact, I'm probably making everybody angry in this to some degree. I'm not satisfying anybody. But what I am coming up with, what I'm presenting to you, I hope, is the reflection of seven years' work, listening to stakeholders, and trying to balance the legitimate interest to come up with a product that does the best good. Right, and trying not to mince words with you. I hope you didn't take it as such. But no. it just seems to me I don't know of any other class that, that can be, uh, you know, parted out like CWP holders and not included in something like this. And then the bill goes even further. It says, and this I think may be another uh, equal protection issue, if someone is between the ages of 18 and 23, they have to have two physician certifications, right? Yep. So how are we possibly, these are adults, they can go to war. How are we possibly saying that they have to have two and then is the insurance company going to pay for the second consult? 
First of all, in regard to the equal protection argument, um, there's not an equal protection issue here for this reason. There's not a suspect class involved, so you're not dealing in a situation where there's heightened scrutiny, okay? We're talking about equal protection in terms of treating different um, non-class uh, groups, non-special class groups, and all you have to have as a matter of public policy is a compelling argument or a rational basis from drawing the distinctions you do. I feel confident that the distinctions that we've drawn in this bill in regard to who can consume medicine and under what conditions satisfies that lowest level of scrutiny that the Equal Protection Clause requires. How so, given age? You're, you're, say, you're discriminating based on age. They have to have another doctor's appointment that I don't see in here that the, the insurance companies have to pay for because of their age, 18 to 23. And why pick them? I think it's, I think it's important because when you're younger, developmentally, marijuana acts in your system in ways that are different than when you're older. Yes. I think it's also arguable that as you're older, you get more experience, you have more maturity. Um, I think that for those reasons, requiring two authorizations in regard to that bracket of ages is, is a rational basis for a public policy. And do insurance um, carriers have to pay for the second one? Insurance carriers don't have to pay for either one. I mean, okay, this is, we, I mean, the insurance yeah. industry came in and said, we want a provision added in there that makes it clear that we're not obligated to pay any claim or, or to, to, to pay any reimbursement for people accessing medical cannabis. That, that's why, that's why I, I have been very clear um, in, in, in keeping the fees down to just what is necessary to cover the cost of DHEX program, because I, don't, I recognize that most people are gonna be purchasing this out of their pocket. And, and unless they have an insurance policy that covers it, um, this law makes clear that there's no mandate. They're sir, not mandated to cover it. So I, I agree with you that it said that they don't have to pay for the product, but it does say that they have to pay for any consultation that would be oh, covered. I misunderstood you. I thought you meant the, the, the product itself. No, okay. I'm talking about if, yeah. if, okay, I could go and say, Doc, I just, I need this because I'm debilitating, uh, have this, you know, horrible pain, and I have to have one visit. So you're discriminating, though, based on age uh, when the what is it, 23 and under crowd have to have two visits. Will the carriers have to pay for the second visit? The answer to that question is I don't know. Um, uh, you're, you're right that there is different criteria. Um, I would have to check and see whether or not they would have to pay for the second certification as well. I'd be happy to check that for you. Okay, but then back to the question, you said between 18 and 23, there's some developmental issues. In fact, you've probably seen the studies where their frontal vortexes are not basically fully developed and marijuana harms the development of the frontal vortex. Have you seen that? It can. I mean, look, I'm not here to say marijuana is a panacea. I'm not here to say that marijuana um, smoked heavily by, by teenage youth can not have an impact on their cognitive abilities. It, it can. It can, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I would be the first to say to you, I would discourage my daughters from smoking marijuana. Um, but, but again, what, what we're talking about here is, is something completely different than a teenager smoking marijuana recreationally. What we put into place here is very tightly regulated and controlled and I, I just think this idea that, that somehow by authorizing cannabis in this oil form to help out patients that have one of 13 special conditions certified by a physician after an inpatient diagnosis is going to lead to increased teen recreational use. I just don't believe it. Do you, you consider vaping smoking? Excuse me? Is vaping smoking? It's not burning leaf. It certainly is, is heating the oil and, and, and inhaling it. Right. Um, I mean, I, we're in a semantics game here. I don't know if you want to call that smoking or not. I, well, I you're, consider... you're talking about smoking marijuana. I think you and I would never recommend that our children smoke marijuana. But now you're, you're making extra hoops for people to jump through that are 23 and younger. So um, are you also acknowledging it's not just smoking? It can be gummies. It can be brownies. It can be these oils, vaping. I think, I think you're making a fair point. And, and in fact, you're making my point is that the reason that that class of individuals is treated differently and needing two certifications is because marijuana at, at that stage in their life could potentially be more problematic. This was an attempt to go ahead and wear belt and suspenders, okay, and making sure that before you 
can consume cannabis in that age group that you have two qualified physicians saying, this is something that you need to address this underlying condition that qualifies. That was the rational basis. And, and I appreciate that. And you've made this same explanation over and over again for all of these various holes in the legislation. You have done your best to do the best you can. Um, and I'm going to sit down and let you move on to other people's questions. But at, at the end of the day, when you're looking at this legislation as a whole, try as you might, and you've done it the best you can, there are still lots of areas where kids, people, can get into trouble with this type of... It's not. Okay, thank well, you. Well, I would say this, though, before you sit down, um, in, in terms of the education that a physician has and, and, and the three hours that the bill requires, and is that a... Did you know, and you probably know, because MUSC is in Charleston and you're from Charleston, that they hold an annual conference about cannabis medicine that is heavily attended by physicians in which the best... Um, cannabis doctors, PhDs, physicians um, come in and they get credit. They get, they get you, know, you know, continuing education credit. That's taking place now. It's, it's taking place tomorrow. There's one tomorrow. I'm, in fact, I'm a panelist on it. So, so you've got medical universities now that are engaging in, in this subject area. They're engaging in this space. I mean, and that goes back to a point that I made earlier Older doctors, older physicians tend to be more resistant to this than younger doctors because the use of cannabis as medicine is a relatively recent phenomenon in the last 20 years or so. So you're starting to see in, in medical school curriculums these sorts of things. So, so the idea that we're foisting a medical cannabis law out there on a population of doctors that is completely unprepared to do it, I, I don't think that's true. Is Dr. Halford going to be at that seminar? I, I don't have the roster of... Do you know uh, Dr. Halford? The name is familiar to me, yes. Okay, and do you know uh, if he's a professor of neurology? I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, Sanford Charleston. And, all right, well, if you don't know, then I won't continue with the questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Senator. Senator from Pickens, what purpose Senator, do you rise? Senator would yield for one quick question. Senator, yield for one quick question. Senator from Buford. Yeah, um, yes, of course sir. I do, I apologize. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Senator. The Senator from Charleston mentioned the concealed weapons permit, CWP. If I look at the bill on page 52 at the top of the page, it appears that somebody that has a certificate uh, to use uh, marijuana would be prohibited from either purchasing or owning a firearm. Is that correct? It, it, no. Well, yes and no. Um, this bill does not prohibit it. This bill requires that the patient be advised that when you fill out a permit to get a, 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 a be able to carry a weapon, that you have to attest on that on that application that you're not in violation of any federal or state law. So I think in fairness and in full disclosure, if you're going to be a patient that wants to access medical cannabis, we felt like there had to be information put in there to let them know that it is still a Schedule One drug under the Controlled Substances Act. So even though it wouldn't be a violation of state law, it would be a violation of federal law. And so it is information being provided to that, to that patient, because I think it's important for them to have. I mean, if, I, mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't want the bill to be silent and to have somebody access medical cannabis, get certified by a doctor if it's legalized by state law, and then to unknowingly fill out an application stating that they're not in violation of federal law, I, I don't think that's a position I wanted that person to be in. So it's in the form of a disclosure to that person so that person is aware. So if they fill the form out properly when it asks that question, and I don't remember exactly My, my how understanding it, is that it does. And, 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 um, you check a yes instead of no, then yeah, you're not yeah, going to get a file. Yeah, and, and again, in, in, in the 37 states that have legalized this medical cannabis law right now, by definition, if they're going to access medical cannabis under state law, and if they're going to apply for, a, uh, you know more about this than I do, but if you're going to apply for a CWP or a carry, whatever it is, I think they ask you that question. It came up because law enforcement wanted this put in there. Law enforcement said people need to be aware that if they access medical cannabis, they may be putting themselves in a position where they can't answer that question in a way that would authorize um, a, a, a permit. Does that make sense? It does. So it sounds like to me, they cannot have a gun, own or, or 
purchase our own, but that, uh, we can check that. I think so. No, I think that's right, but that's, that, that's, that is the case. That's the reality that, that federal law, CSA, has it as a Schedule I drug. Um, Okay, um, I didn't make it as far as I thought I'd make it in terms of uh, going through the bill, but I'll, um, I'll continue. Um, where were we when we, we stopped? Um, beginning, all right, I'm going to go back to, well, anyway, the definitions I think we were in, and um, um, on, um, give you the proper section here, section 44-53-2010. Subparagraph so eight. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because it, it outlines all of the uh, debilitating conditions, the 13 conditions for which. Senator from Darlington, what purpose do you rise? Raise the point of a quorum. Point of a quorum has been raised. The clerk will count. Twenty-two members are present. A quorum is not present. It's a stand, stand at ease for a second. Stand at ease. Quorum is. Quorum is now present. Thank you, sir. Thank you for letting. A quorum is present. The Senate will come to order. A quorum is present. The Senator from Buford has the floor. It's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. President. Um, as I was saying, the definition of debilitating conditions, we've already gone through that. Um, I would only point out two things in uh, subparagraph 8A, Roman numeral V or, or 5, um, when you're talking about PTSD, um, as a qualifying condition, it's subject to the evidential requirements of 44-53-2100A, and I'm going to flip to that real quick because I think this is, this is important. Um, an individual seeking to uh, access medical cannabis for PTSD has to provide um, evidence um, that uh, he or she has experienced one or more traumatic events Acceptable evidence must include, but is not limited to, proof of military service in an active combat zone that the person was a victim of violent or sexual crime or that the person was a first responder, up uh, to Senator Sen's point about the first responder. Um, the idea there is some of the, the criticisms we got were, were that PTSD, unlike some of these other qualifying conditions, doesn't lend itself to objective empirical diagnoses. And so as a way to sort of like provide assurance that the person coming in claiming PTSD wasn't lying, um, we included that requirement of um, experience of one or more traumatic events. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise? See if the senator would yield for questions. For, for questions. Yes. Senator Yields. Senator Yields. Senator, uh, you know, I served on the subcommittee and in full committee, and but I've read the bill at least a half a dozen times in its various versions. Um, I'm reading it again, and I and I would say that it's it is it is like digesting an elephant. I mean, it's just very complex. Did you know? Would you agree with that? It it, it is. I mean, it's 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 we're dealing with a subject matter that we have not dealt with before, and and it involves a whole host of 
of public policy considerations that we haven't dealt with before. And, and, and by its nature, uh, since it involves um, medical science, it's going to be complicated by that level as well. And then you factor in all of that, the alleged uh, societal consequences of it, you, you've, you've kind of made yourself the ultimate law school question. Right. And did you know, Senator, as I, as I mentioned to you earlier in the day, you know, that I could take several approaches to determining my vote on this. One would be just to look at the big picture and say, well, I want to help Ms. Richardson, so I'm going to vote yes. Or, or I think this is going to harm law and order, and I'm going to vote no. And, and, and there's big picture considerations here, and I'm not downplaying that at all. But also, uh, I'm a very process-oriented person, uh, Senator, and did you know that this bill, 55 pages of it, is laying out uh, an enormous framework for everything from what conditions uh, can allow someone to access this to, to uh, how does that affect companies and the way they deal with employees. It's, it's enormous. And so from that point of view, Senator, I, I don't see any way to, to arrive at an at a, uh, informed decision on my part, whether anybody else feels like this or not, without taking this bill apart uh, section by section and question by question, uh, because at the end of the day, for me anyway, uh, understanding the trees is going to in inform my view of the picture I'm looking at, did you know? I, and you made that point earlier, um, Senator from Anderson, that understanding the trees will help you assess the forest. And, and, and I, I'm perfectly willing, um, as a way of going about this, um, uh, as we go through the bill and as I, I get to a section and as I kind of give the reasons how we arrived at it, dissecting it, taking apart, questioning, challenging as I go along with it. It's, it's not my intention to predominate on the floor up here, but I do think you're right. It's, an, it's important for each member to fully understand each tree uh, in order to determine how they're going to vote on the forest. And, and I, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. I wish, I wish there was another way to go about it, but, but, um, but you just nailed the head, uh, hit the head, nail the head in terms of on the one hand, if you just did this from a 40,000 foot view, it's a matter of do you give Margaret Richardson medicine or do you listen to law enforcement and say, no, this is going to make our job much harder. What you're saying is you need to get down into, into, the, into the specifics in order to make that assessment. That's right. And Senator, uh, perhaps next week when we get started, I, I'm going to try to get you from the very beginning and just go through this thing page by page because that's what I've sure. done a half a dozen times and I'm making notes and did you know, Senator, I, I don't consider myself a hostile questioner, not that I no. say anybody else is, but uh, I, I can't get the answers without asking the, the person who wrote the bill, and that's you. Of course. And uh, that's going to be important to me. So we're already uh, two pages into the bill, and I'm not going to try to cover much today, but I do, I do want to just say that did you know that after the passage of this bill, a committee will determine additional conditions uh, which would allow someone to uh, access medical marijuana, but at the beginning, today, right now, we are the committee that is approving the original conditions under which a physician uh, may fill out a certificate. And so did you know that, and I think you've taken this seriously, that, uh, and this may be someone's argument against this bill, I mean, we are in, in that sense uh, providing kind of a right to try approach to people. Did you know that I, in the committee meetings, that we, that we distributed a list from the National Academy of Sciences and so forth. And I got a list from both those who were favorable and, and those who were opposed to the bill. And both lists agreed on uh, the conditions upon which their 
is empirical evidence from this National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which is referenced in your bill at the very beginning. And what I just want to briefly point out to you, uh, perhaps we can get a copy of this to the various member, is that there are some conditions that these studies which are referenced say there is conclusive or substantial evidence that medical marijuana uh, is effective in treating these conditions, correct? There, there is, you're referring to the National Academy of Sciences, but, and that was published in 2017. And, and the point I was making yesterday I can make further is that there are hundreds of other peer-reviewed studies as well. Um, and what I've attempted to do is, is narrow the universe of qualifying conditions down to those things for which I think there is substantial medical authority. Your point is some, some may differ, some other studies may differ, and, and, and that's true. But, but the reason I take some comfort in all of this is at the end of the day, it's that physician in consultation with that patient that decides what's in that patient's best interest. It doesn't matter what, uh, it really, I mean, it matters because it's evidentiary, but it's, it's secondary to that in-person diagnosis that a physician makes. So, so what the National Academy of Sciences said or the Multiple Sclerosis Society or the Academy of Physicians or whatever they might be, that's great for us to have as policymakers, and we ought to talk about that. But we should never lose sight of the fact that the most important conversation is going to be between that physician and that patient based on that patient's condition and history and that physician exercising his or her skill. I mean, to me, if I was to say what is the foundation of this bill, it is that. Th this entire bill has been drafted, at least I've intended to be drafted, to be physician-centric, that it's centered on that. They're the ones that have the authority to authorize its use. They're the ones that have the authority to say no. And I personally think that's what that ought to be. It ought to be not at the state level. And not, I mean, at, at some extent, it's going to be because we have qualifying conditions we outline because we make laws. But that is going to be secondary, ultimately, in importance to what does that physician and that patient decide in that patient's best interest. Okay. Well, that clarifies your thinking somewhat for me. Uh, because since we are determining the original conditions, you would almost have to footnote this extensively to say, and the reason Crohn's disease is on here is because we have these three peer-reviewed studies that indicates that medical marijuana is either very effective, somewhat effective, et, et cetera. So but, but ultimately, but ultimately um, irrespective of how many studies you want to line up on one side or studies on the other, there is evidence if there is evidence it could be of medicinal benefit, why would you not want to empower a physician to authorize the patient's use of that if in that physician's opinion after diagnosing, think it's in that patient's best interest? I guess that's the way I would phrase that issue is, I want to empower doctors, okay? I want the doctors to be sovereign there with the patient. And, and we have to, as lawmakers, kind of define a universe, because that's what we do, okay? But, but the universe that I've defined here, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that for every patient that has PTSD or every patient that has epilepsy or cancer or whatever those things, it doesn't say that, yes, cannabis can help you. All that is is a definition of what authority, what empowerment we're giving to physicians. And the physician ultimately is going to be the one that makes that determination. So I, I think, I think there's, that's an important point here is that we're not, by passing this law, saying that patients that have these 13 qualifying conditions can automatically benefit from medical cannabis. That's not it at all. That's just the beginning of the inquiry. This, this is the scope of the authority we're giving to a physician. It's that physician in that examination room that's making that determination. And ultimately, I, I think that's where I have the most comfort. That's where I want the power pushed down to. I want to push down there. I understand uh, your explanation. Uh, I do think it is a pretty important point that maybe I haven't picked up on in committee or subcommittee because we heard a lot of testimony about uh, this condition or that condition could be helped. It sounds like what you're saying is that regardless of whether that condition's on here and even almost regardless of whether the committee was to add it later on because there's going to be a committee 
that's going to meet a minimum twice per year to consider additional conditions, which would allow someone to allow the physician, the physician should be aware of when examining a patient. But it's, it almost sounds like you, you're saying that in addition to all of that, it's up really up to the doctor uh, that it's including all of these things, but not limited to these things, that if the doctor feels like medical marijuana could help you, then he has that latitude to fill out a certificate accordingly. Is, I mean, is, am I stating that accurately? Tom Davis's view is that the state ought not interfere with that physician-patient relationship. This bill, however, does circumscribe that relationship by saying a physician can only authorize its use for certain medical conditions. So, so the statement I was making was in terms of philosophically, I see this bill as one that empowers physicians because I think that's the primal, that's the very first public policy argument we ought to be advancing when it talks to help about health care. Okay? But, but to your point, this bill does not give a physician unbridled discretion. This, this does not give them the ability to go outside of those 13 qualifying conditions. They are constrained in that regard. It is that way because people are concerned about it being abused. They're, they're concerned that it's a brand new program and that we ought to go slow, that we ought to take a cautious first step. I respect all that. I'm practical and pragmatic about this. I want to pass something that's going to help people, okay, that, that actually gets passed into law. And so what my personal preferences might be are secondary to what does, what does this body want to do? And, and, and maybe I've inferred the wrong things, but I think what this body wants to do, reflecting what their citizens want, constituencies want, is something that at this, at this stage is, is, is narrow, is regulated, is conservative, so that we have the ability to observe and to see what the effects have been. That, that's, that was my reason for coming up with 13 qualifying conditions, not because I think the state ought to be interfering with what a physician thinks is in a patient's best interest and that patient concurrence, but because as a, as a reality and in terms of and recognition of the fact that this is something brand new, that the appetite was going to be to go slow. That's the reason for that. I understand. And I'm I'm going to say a few more things, not to belabor the point, but it's an important point. It is an important point. We, we are standing, as it were, in the place of the FDA with these 13 initial conditions. Now, this document I have that is from 2017, admittedly. National Academy. Yeah. yeah. So when I, when I look at this document, I can kind of rate these conditions based on whether there's conclusive evidence, moderate evidence, limited evidence, or no or insufficient evidence, because that's the way they're presented. And right. both the doctors who were for and the doctors who spoke against medical marijuana referenced the same sheet. So they all seem to agree that what's on this piece of paper is an accurate reflection of what was in the National Academy of Sciences studies. That was based, yeah, you're, and you're right, that was based right. in 2017 so, upon a review of 10,000 different scientific abstracts, and right. then they broke it down into those evidentiary categories. Which is a, a large number, 10,000 yes. abstracts. Mm -hmm. This is what they concluded. But the 13 conditions that you've got listed here aren't found on this document. Crohn's but, disease but, is not on here. But, but they I, are found in other, other periodical peer-reviewed studies. And, I, I understand, Senator. Uh, and I guess the point I'm making is I can trace this to the bill. Mm -hmm. Unless you're going to provide the documentation of why you have included Crohn's disease, then I and all the rest of us are just going to take your word for it that there is peer-reviewed evidence that these 13 afflictions, at least these 13, could benefit from medical marijuana. Now, now what, what, just I, let me wait for a second. I don't want you to take my word for it. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you the site to the study right now so that you can look at it over the weekend if you'd like me to. I, I don't want them right now. I, okay. I but, mean, but, I, but, I, but to answer your question, directly, I think you have the sites. I'm not doubting that. I'll provide them. But that is, I mean, that is in fact what we're doing. We're setting out the initial conditions with the understanding that a committee later on, based upon evidence, including 
public hearings can add conditions to that list. But initially, we are the doctors, because yeah. that committee is going to be made up of 11 people. Initially, we're standing in the place of that committee and saying, for these 13, uh, we give the green light. And then after that, it's kind of going to fall on their lap to say, well, hey, there's, there's new studies, and we should add this condition. Or they may say, I guess it's potential, they could say, there are so many studies now that show that there's insufficient evidence, perhaps we should remove a condition. I don't know if that would ever happen. I'm just, you know, kind of thinking randomly. Yeah. But that's going to be their job. Uh, and so, did you know, Senator, it, it does give me comfort if I end up voting for this bill that when people ask me, uh, I'll be able to tell them a lot of things because I'm, I'm very informed of the bill. But I will be able to say, well, these 10,000 abstracts provide conclusive evidence or they provide moderate evidence for these conditions that we put in this bill. And so I'm positive you have the footnotes. Yeah, uh, but your point's well taken. I mean, you need to have a justification for whatever decision you make. And, 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 and I respect that, and I'll provide you with those studies. Thank you. Yes, sir. Senator from, Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? A unanimous consent request. State your request. Um, Mr. President, earlier we gave second reading to S-947, which is a bill that Senator Pickens explained dealing with driving training schools. Um, he mentioned there's some, some urgency to that bill getting over to the House. I ask unanimous consent with the Senator from Beaufort holding the floor that we give that bill a third reading tomorrow. The unanimous consent is to give S-947, so at the bottom of page 15, third reading on Friday with the senator from Buford holding the floor. Is there objection to that unanimous consent request? Hearing none, so ordered. Senator from Cherokee, what purpose Mr. do you have? Senator from Buford holding the floor, I have a unanimous consent request. The senator from Buford holding the floor, state your request. Mr. President, I mutually agreed to point in time. I ask that the Senate invite the House to ratify acts. Okay. All in favor say aye. Those no. Ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator from Buford, what purpose do you ask? I would move that the Senate be now adjourned. Motion is the Senate do now adjourn. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. We're adjourned till Tuesday at high noon. <laughs>